At this time, will all Sergeant at Arms please start your recordings? Sergeant Kotowski, you may begin with your opening statement. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Transportation. At this time, would everyone please turn on their video? Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you. We're ready to begin. Hello? Should I begin? Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Okay. Thank you all for joining uh, in our hearing on DOT's Open Street program. The response to COVID-19 and private streets legislation. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedure items. Thank you. I'm Elliot Lynn, counsel to the Transportation Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelists will be. The first panelists in this hearing will be from the Department of Transportation. Commissioner Polly Trottenberg, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zack, and Deputy Commissioner for Transportation Planning and Management, Eric Beaton. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and the chair or I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. Please also note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Today, the committee transportation convened the remotely, to, the remotely hearing to hold this, convers this conversation of a side topic, how DOTs is working with the open, with the open streets program and how the agency respond to COVID-19. Of course, I gotta say that all I have is great experience working with the DOT commissioner. And I'm here from Dykeman between Broadway and Seaman in the open street that thank you to you, thank you to Rebecca, thank you to the whole team. We make that a reality that uh, the business owner in this area, the pedestrian, the cyclist, they've been enjoying the benefit of open street in the whole block at Dykeman between Broadway and Seaman. And I think that this is the type of experience that we need to look at and see what we can learn. The good and thing that also can be improved. As the pandemic took hold in the city, our normally busy streets and roads became desert. As sheltering in place orders took effect and New Yorkers began to practice social distancing. This unusual situation became the perfect opportunity to implement important and creative measures to ensure that people have adequate space for exercising and enjoying the outdoors, all while social distance. Also, today we need to look at and see how did the agency in the city work with the MTA to improve bus services, especially the bus ways how did we expand city bike during this process? How, what did we learn about improving safety for Rebel and the home office industry in the city of New York? In April, the committee heard intro number 1933 introduced by council member Kalina Rivera, which would have provided the city with 75 miles of temporary open street for cyclists and pedestrians to utilize the pandemic. 
Shortly after the hearing, the administration announced they would be providing 100 miles of open streets throughout New York City. The program began on May 2nd, 2020, and as June 24, they have been 67 total miles of open streets. Of course, we want to be positive. We want to see what is the plan to continue expanding. I propose that we expand on this great initiative, which has, which has revitalized and opened our streets for New Yorkers to use and enjoy. DOT will look into ways they, that they can set up a department that will focus on the open street program. That's my idea. I introduced language already for a potential LS request that would like to make the open street permanent in the city of New York. Therefore, I hope that we can work with DOT, especially the commissioner, to make that a reality. We need to study the mechanisms that are in play and who will stand to benefit from these important programs. Additionally, I also believe that the, 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 the Department of Transportation in the city should explore the possibility of making many of these open streets a, a, a experience where business owners, pedestrians, and cyclists come together to plan the future of the use of our streets in our city. I have no doubt that this initiative will get us to the goal of the being the most pedestrians and cyclist friendly city in the world, something that I've been advocating for since elected in 2009 and for the last seven years as a chairman of this committee. In today's hearing, we hope to hear from the administration regarding the status of this program and other measures taken in response to COVID-19 as well as their plans to continue rethinking the way we use our valuable street space. The Open Streets Initiative has helped many small businesses struggling to stay open during this challenging time. I hope to hear from the administration as how they were able to work alongside the mom and pop shop who wanted to apply for outdoor dining. And most important, what is the mechanism that, mechanism that we have in place to do the assessment on how the program is working, benefiting restaurants, but also pedestrians, cyclists, and all New Yorkers. We also hope to hear from advocates and community members regarding issues with the program and ways it could be improved in the future. In addition to this oversight topic, the committee will consider two bills introduced by Council Member Mario by request of the Staten Island Board President related to private streets. Intro number 2051 is a local law in relation to establishing permit requirements for private streets to be mapped on a starting island. And intro number 2052 is a local law in relation to redefining and regulating private streets on a starting island. I will now call on minority leaders Mario, Mario to give an opening statement on his bills. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here today to speak on the two bills that I introduced with Borough President Otto that address longstanding issues with the construction and maintenance of private roads on Staten Island. These pieces of legislation are the culmination of a public discussion that has been going on in our borough for some time now. For many years, the process for receiving, <clears throat> excuse me, private road waivers from the New York City Board of Standard Appeals was considered pro forma. However, that has since changed. The result has been that private roads are no longer, um, private road requests are no longer assured. In fact, the norm seems to have become the opposite. It is now incumbent upon us in government to provide a path for private roads to be built to proper and safe standards and to see that they are added to the city map. For too long, Staten Island's road network was subject to piecemeal development that often did not adequately protect community interest. And at the same time, the existing mapping process did not offer a straightforward path for developers. These bills seek to provide a roadmap for private roads on Staten Island so that developers can proceed with construction that will give quality road access to emergency and other vehicles. Additionally, we are creating a true responsibility for existing and future private roads so that their maintenance is never again neglected moving forward. I look forward to working with all the stakeholders in this legislation so that we can finally get private roads done right. Thank you.
I will now have our moderator and committee counsel call on the administration to testify and to administer the oath. I will now call on members of the administration. First, from the Department of Transportation, Commissioner Polly Trottenberg, Deputy Commissioner for Transportation Planning and Management, Eric Beaton, and Assistant Commissioner of Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zack. I will now read the affirmation and then I will call on each individual to confirm their response on the record. Please raise your right hand. <laughs> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Trottenberg? I do. Deputy Commissioner Beaton? I do. Assistant Commissioner Zach? I do. Thank you. You may begin when ready. All right, ready, ready for me to do my testimony? Mr. Chairman? Okay. Good morning, Chairman Rodriguez, members of the Transportation Committee. I'm Polly Trottenberg, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation, joined here by my colleagues. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Mayor Bill de Blasio on DOT's response to COVID-19 and the administration's Open Streets program. These last six months have been some of the hardest our city has ever faced. We've lost far too many family members, friends, neighbors, and colleagues to COVID-19, including fellow workers in city government and the MTA. And we've seen too many New Yorkers lose their jobs and too many beloved businesses close their doors. As we all know, communities of color have been disproportionately hurt by this public health and economic crisis. And we've all experienced a summer of racial justice and police brutality protests sparked by the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and others. At DOT, we're engaged in the urgent and critical work of ensuring our programs, projects, contact, contracting processes, and agency culture and practices are more equitable. While this has been a focus of the de Blasio administration from the outset, the work is far from over. This summer, we worked with our employees of color on a number of new initiatives, including launching an executive level equity and planning working group that will be tasked with evaluating the impact of DOT's programs and services on communities of color, low income communities, women, and people with disabilities, and identifying areas where we can do better. And we're continuing our internal efforts to foster a workplace free from racial discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. Building on the work we've done already to enhance diversity, equity, and inclusion at DOT, we're launching a structured hiring guide consistent with citywide equal opportunity employment regulations with new oversight procedures for the hiring process. And this fall, we're expanding training on racial justice and implicit bias for all DOT senior managers. We're proud of this work thus far, but we know there's much more to do, both personally and professionally, to combat the structural racism that pervades our society and our city. I'll now turn to our agency's response to COVID-19. When the virus overtook the city in March, DOT worked to keep its employees safe while fulfilling the agency's critical functions. We maintain the city's transportation system, making emergency repairs to roadways, bridges, sidewalks, and traffic operations infrastructure. We continue to run the Staten Island Ferry 24 seven. And as some New Yorkers took advantage of nearly empty streets to speed recklessly, we kept our speed cameras on and continued to expand the program. In fact, just last week, we announced that we activated cameras in all 750 school zones as authorized by the state and lowered speed limits on nine of the city's most crash prone quarters. We did all this despite tremendous operational challenges, employees falling ill, quarantining, and sadly, some losing their lives. And we certainly mourn their loss. We transitioned many staff to teleworking, redesigned all our major operations for the COVID era, and worked closely with our union partners to ensure that our workforce remains socially distanced, well-equipped, and full. Sorry, looks like my mute button hit there. Um, and we at DOT have answered the call, working tirelessly to keep New Yorkers safe and moving, maintain our infrastructure, and quickly grow innovative programs on our streets. But as it is for all agencies, the current financial climate for DOT is very difficult, especially after so many years of steady growth. Between the executive and adopted fiscal year 21 plans, DOT is implementing $125 million in budget cuts, representing 12% of our 1.1 billion expense budget. And we expect to face additional budget cuts this year, particularly if the federal government does not give the city additional stimulus funding 
or the state does not grant us long-term borrowing authority. Further, after three years of a partial hiring freeze, we've had a nearly complete freeze since March and are now also facing potentially a sizable layoff scenario of existing employees. These staffing constraints are an enormous challenge for DOT, one of the most diverse and complex agencies in city government with a list of popular programs and projects that has grown every year. We now have an 8% vacancy rate with hundreds of positions unfilled and that list is growing every month. I'm so grateful to the current DOT staff who are performing miracles of endurance and creativity to execute on our current initiatives, but the current fiscal reality means that every pu public dollar must be put towards the highest priority programs and projects. This means that while we focus on our core charter mandated operations and critical responses to COVID, we face challenges in implementing the many new programs enacted in recent years, including the Streets Master Plan, the Reckless Driver Accountability Program, and the Shared E-Scooter Pilot Program. These new programs would collectively require roughly 20 additional staff and cost nearly 9 million in fiscal year 21. In fiscal year 22, they would scale up dramatically to 300 additional staff and cost almost 200 million as the programmatic work for the master plan is scheduled to be underway fully. These new programs are all knowingly enacted without the necessary budgetary resources. And unfortunately, unless the city's fiscal situation improves, these new programs will have to be greatly reduced in scope or delayed, or funding and headcount will have to be shifted from other priorities. That being said, let me discuss some of the incredible work our agency has been doing to reimagine and repurpose our streets. First, under the mayor's leadership with the council, advocates and others urgently calling for more space for pedestrians and cyclists to socially distance, DOT, NYPD, parks and community partners created the largest open streets program in the country with over 75 miles of streets citywide. Nearly 50% of the open streets are in zip codes with the highest rates of COVID-19 in the city, mostly communities of color, and nearly 60% are in census tracts that are low to moderate income. This summer, we implemented two programs to help children play and everyone stay cool. Our Play Streets initiative provided families with safe structured activities on 14 open streets in neighborhoods most impacted by COVID-19. We also designated 16 open streets in the most heat burdened communities as cool streets, locations in DEP's cool hydrant and spray cap program. All of this could not have been possible without the support of many bids and community groups. And I wanna thank them for all their commitment to this program. To improve the program for communities of color and COVID impacted neighborhoods going forward, we're still actively seeking additional community partners and we encourage council members to refer interested groups. And of course, we value and seek your input as we plan for the program's long-term future. Implementing open streets taught us a lot and enabled us to continue to creatively rethink how we use our streets, including helping our city's struggling restaurant industry. Under the mayor's leadership and as codified in council member Reynoso's bill to allow outdoor dining, the city put forth the open restaurants program at record speed. The program allowed restaurants to self certify and begin taking advantage of sidewalk and street space outside of their establishments in time for phase two of the city's reopening. To date, over 10,000 restaurants have applied to take advantage of the program and serve customers outdoors, making open restaurants, we believe, the largest program of its kind. This enormously popular program has supported jobs for approximately 100,000 people, a diverse workforce from all five boroughs, and generated much needed economic activity and tax revenue. We're grateful to all our partners in this monumental effort, which required creativity, problem solving, and breaking down agency silos. I want to thank our sister agencies, including SBS, MOM, the Office of Nightlife, as well as bids and industry partners like the New York City Hospitality Alliance, the New York State Latino Restaurant, Bar and Lounge Association, Rockwell Group, Melba Wilson, the Chinatown Partnership, and many others. And we've successfully combined two popular programs with open streets and open restaurants, allowing New Yorkers to visit some of their favorite restaurants as they safely dine outdoor on car-free streets, as the chairman of the committee is doing even as we speak. We look forward to discussing with the council ways to make elements of the open restaurants program a permanent fixture in our city, and the mayor has already announced its return next summer. And now we're once again answering the call to use our city streets to help our kids learn and exercise outdoors. Together with the Department of Education, Parks, and other agency partners, we've identified and approved outdoor learning space for almost 800 schools across the five boroughs, including on almost 160 streets. We work hard, quickly, identify and assess these spaces, 
prioritizing schools and communities of color and those hardest hit by the pandemic. Now I'm gonna to turn to the agency's work to keep New Yorkers moving and keep freight flowing during the crisis as we work to help keep the city recovering. First, buses have served a critical role in transporting essential frontline workers and members of the communities hardest hit by the pandemic. In June, the mayor announced the Better Buses Restart Program with nine major bus, busway and bus lane projects in all five boroughs to give New Yorkers safe, reliable, and fast public transit options as the city reopens. Since then, we've already completed four bus projects, the busway along J Street in Brooklyn, bus lane extensions on East 14th Street in Manhattan and Malcolm X Boulevard in Brooklyn, and a major bus lane on 149th Street in the Bronx, uh, right near Lincoln Hospital, a, a critical lifeline for frontline healthcare workers. In addition, DOT is currently constructing bus lanes on E.L. Grant Highway in the Bronx, Highland Boulevard in Staten Island, as well as bus improvements on Rockaway Beach Boulevard. By the end of the year, we hope to have installed more bus mileage than we've ever completed in a single year, and many focused in communities of color throughout the city. And in August, along with our partners at the MTA, we announced the expansion of the bus lane camera enforcement program with stationary cameras activated on nine new corridors and MTA bus mounted cameras on three new routes. Finally, DOT has been rolling out transit signal priority to bus corridors faster than ever before, and we've already exceeded our 2020 goal of 300 intersections. We will continue to add more TSB corridors throughout the rest of the year. Next, we've also seen a cycling boom as many New Yorkers shift trips from public transit. Since April, on average, we've seen 26% more cyclists on protected lanes and bridges throughout the city than in the same period last year. And with weekend cycling up 57%. In response to this boom and building on safety improvements and guiding principles laid out on our green wave plan, DOT is installing protected bicycle lanes with a focus on closing important gaps in the bike network, supporting trips made by essential workers, facilitating interborough trips and encouraging neighborhood access to parks and open space. To date, DOT has installed nine miles of permanent and temporary protected bike lanes during the crisis with several more temporary lanes underway. We expect to install over 25 miles of permanent protected bike lanes this year, more than the number installed in previous years, despite being unable to work fully for the first half of our usual construction season due to the pandemic. And in June, we celebrated the 100 millionth city bike ride and the system's 1,000th station since its launch in 2013, we installed it up in the South Bronx. In addition, City Bikes Critical Worker Membership Program has provided 18,000 critical workers with more than 500,000 free bike trips to date. Well, much of our attention during these last few months has rightfully been on addressing the COVID-19 crisis, our agency has continued to look ahead at the city's transportation needs for recovery and beyond. Prior to the onset of COVID-19, we were seeing some challenging trends with vehicle ownership in midtown congestion rising, more deliveries, and a continued decline in transit ridership. These past six months have shown just how critical our transportation system is in keeping the city running, helping essential workers get to their jobs, as well as accommodating increased freight activity. To help DOT and the city meet these critical needs and plan for the future, Mayor de Blasio named members of a Surface Transportation Council in May. We thank these members for their service and are proud to have partnered with them as we've led the nation in operationalizing many of their key recommendations from open streets and open restaurants to outdoor learning and the dramatic expansion of busways and bike lanes. We know that some members of the council hope to hear more from us and we will continue to engage with them in the coming months. And of course, our work is far from over. This fall, as the city continues to reopen and the school year begins, we're closely monitoring traffic and transit ridership trends. Our experience from previous crises, including the 1980 and 2005 transit strikes, 9-11 and Hurricane Sandy, shows the necessity of strong traffic management strategies during significant shifts to driving. Despite much lower levels of economic activity in the Manhattan Central Business District, vehicle traffic volumes into Manhattan have been steadily increasing since April and are now within 3% of pre-pandemic levels. As the mayor said, we need to be ready for every eventuality. Thus, we're evaluating potential traffic management strategies to respond to increased congestion, including HOV and license plate-based restrictions. We would not take implementing such complex strategies lightly, but as we saw following 9-11 and Hurricane Sandy, such measures can successfully counter gridlock and may once again be necessary to help the city recover. Now I will turn briefly to touch on the two bills before the committee today, intros 2051 and 2052. 
on mapping and other requirements for new private streets in Staten Island, as well as maintenance requirements for the paving, signage, and plowing of all private streets in the borough. Well, we're still in the process of reviewing these bills and of course talking to Council Member Matteo, Borough President Otto, and, and others, we understand that there are many concerns around the issue of private streets and look forward to discussing the legislation further. I will say that new agency reviews of private street plans as well as inspection and enforcement of maintenance requirements, which the legislation as drafted would create, cannot be done without additional resources. And as we all know, resources are extremely tight amidst the current fiscal crisis. In conclusion, COVID-19 has transformed our city in ways that were unimaginable only six months ago. I'm proud of the work that the men and women of DOT have done to meet the changing needs of New Yorkers and the many demands on our streets. I look forward to continuing to work with the council to help our city recover as we all know it will. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I welcome your questions. Thank you. We have been joined by council members, Matteo, Cohen, Diaz, Holden, Ku, Yeager, Reynoso, Cabrera, Levin, Levine, Menchaca, and Deutsch. Chair Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you, Elio, and the whole uh, uh, staff of the lawyer and analysts of this great committee. Uh, I, I would like to give the opportunity first to uh, the uh, council member Mario to ask any question on on his bills so that uh, after we address all the private street, then we move on on the other uh, questions related to COVID-19 and open street. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez, I appreciate that. Um, Commissioner, how are you? Uh, Good to see you on Zoom. Um, Good to see you, Council Member. <laughs> uh, thank you for your communication always and your staff. We may not always agree, but uh, I appreciate your um, willingness to, to work and communicate with myself and my office. Um, you know how I feel about Borough Commissioner Tom Coca-Cola, uh, a great Borough Commissioner and uh, a good man for Staten Island. So and I want to thank your, your staff as well and thank Rebecca you. and the rest of your team. Um, again, especially, you know, on issues we don't agree on, you're always um, professional and, and it's much appreciated. So, you know, I, I want to get into private streets and I know you, you didn't have um, many, much substantive comments on it and it's legislation we're certainly going to have to discuss further. Um, and obviously, and we all know, especially with me, any resources that have to come with legislation are always important to me and it's something we obviously will have to address and discuss down the line. Um, I just mentioned that obviously because you mentioned on your testimony, but um, you know, private streets have become more and more of an of an issue, especially on Staten Island. Um, and we're trying to come up with um, a map, a, a platform to to make this process better in terms of mapping streets. Um, so, just a few questions. Again, I know you haven't um, really talked much about the substance, but can you tell me, do you know how many private streets are in, are in the borough or uh, in the city? Uh, yeah, I'm going to actually, us? while I'm, um, while I'm saying, we, we, you may remember the council had required us um, to engage in an exercise where we actually track all that. the, you know, what? I just found it. Here we go. All right. Good. Um, and remember the way this, the way this process worked is each of the borough presidents were su supposed to provide us with a number and then city planning provided it their own number. The two numbers did not mesh. Okay. And in the case of Staten Island, we didn't get the number from the borough president, but the city planning number for private streets as of 2017 was 1,588. Total? And for the city total, it's um, according to um, Department of City Planning, it's 2,715. Okay. The numbers we got from the borough presidents minus Staten Island, which we didn't get, was 911 citywide. So there's obviously a big disparity. Yep. In those yep. So, so about 15, 1600 on, on Staten Island, is that what you said? That's what city planning requires. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. So um, so what, what, are, what are the common issues DOT sees and hears and with, with, with private streets and, and the concerns that, that the agency has? Uh, regarding private right. and, and look, Councilmember, we certainly share 
the, the, the concerns about private states, that they are a big problem from the city's point of view. And look, Staten Island clearly has the most, but other boroughs do as well. And I've certainly heard from some of your colleagues uh, who are experiencing some of the same issues. You know, unfortunately, I think we particularly see this in Staten Island, you know this well, developers were granted the right to put up their developments and build roadways that were not map city streets that did not meet the city's standards for drainage and quality. And as the years have gone by, many of these roads, you know, they're substandard and they're in a state of deterioration. Staten Island, I don't need to tell you this, flooding is a huge issue with some of these private roads. The challenge is, you know, for the city to sort of absorb that inventory, it's enormously costly. It's billions and billions of dollars to build all those roads up to city standards. I certainly understand the frustration on Staten Island, and I think we are, you know, very committed to working with you all to see what we can potentially do. We, we certainly agree that it is a real problem, and, and most of all in your borough, but there are private streets in other boroughs too. Uh, understood. And, um, and under, understanding the existing private streets and the issues with that. And I think, uh, in terms of talking about the celestrations, you know, how do we move forward? How do we? come up with a mapping strategy that um, is beneficial to everyone, uh, the community, the agency, developers, um, all the stakeholders involved. Because I think, and especially the number you just said about what it would take to deal with some of the issues of the existing private streets, it's, it's overwhelming. So we're trying to come up with a process going forward that you know deals with those issues because you all know, and my colleagues know, and anyone who has a private street, you know, one, some of them don't even know they're on a private street. That, that's whether yeah. they should know, or they should be when they buy a, a house or a condo, whatever they're in, they should know. The reality is they don't. They call us when it's not plowed or when they're in an area where DOT is repaving streets, and obviously they're not going to repave the, the private streets. Um, when there's flooding issues, just normal pothole issues. So the, these are the issues that 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 certainly um, arise. So we're, we're we're trying to understand how do, how do we make the process better. So in terms of mapping a street, right? If if we're going to move away from having private streets as is, we want to go into a mapping process. From, from my perspective, I like to make that as clear and effective and poignant as possible. So mm -hmm. with that said, in terms, you know that how, how many maybe mapping requests that your agency has, or, uh, you know, are, are there a lot of mapping requests that, 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 that you are looking at now in terms of um, yeah, that, that maybe I'll, I'll have the team check on that while we're talking. I don't think we get a lot, but let me see if I can I can okay. hunt that number down. So if I am in the process of trying to map a street, right? Um, you know, I've looked at this. I've had my staff look. You know, you go on the city planning uh, website and they can give you some some things on what to do normally, but it's not a clear cut strategy in my opinion. But what is DOT's role? When does DOT step in in a mapping process currently? Is it, you know, based on when it, when when another agency just says, okay, we're, we're in this process, we have this request, what is DOT's thoughts? Like, wh wh where does DOT fit into the current process of trying to map the street? Right, it, it's a good question. And look, I would say, I, I don't disagree with you that it's a complicated process. And obviously it involves DOT and BSA and Department of City Planning. And I think sort of any discussion about how we improve it going forward, we probably need to get all those. Yeah, and I would even add DP as well, and FDNY, you know. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, there, there's, you know, there can be what we've seen in Staten Island where you're sort of doing greenfield um, construction and developers, uh, you know, apply to the BSA for a waiver. I think DOT has an ability to weigh in on whether we approve it or not. Um, and we've certainly worked with with some of the elected officials on Staten Island various times. Now, Manresa comes to mind as one, uh, you know, where we certainly didn't want to see private streets. But I think all the players involved, we have certain sort of legal 
restrictions on how much discretion we have. I would also say that, you know, sometimes I have elected officials who come to me and they don't want to allow it to be a private street and sometimes they do. So mm -hmm. it is it is not a good process. I'm the first to admit we would be happy to work with you um, right. to try and make it something better. Right. And 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 that, I guess that's the frustration. So if, if you're not if if someone is not getting a, a a GCL 36 waiver and it was denied and we, we want to push to map the streets, nine out of 10 people will come to, and, and this is just from my perspective saying, I have no idea how to go through this process of mapping street. And two, it seems the time frame is way too long. Um, and, and that's a concern to me too, because if we're going to go down a road, which I think we should in terms of uh, mapping streets for better projects, for better, so we don't have to deal with private street issues anymore. We have to make that process, I think, um, efficient. And I think that's incumbent of us working with you and the agency to do that. And, and that's the goal from my perspective, to come up with this, this, this game plan that you can say, okay, now I understand. You know, something with, with legitimate and uh, rational time frames and where each agency then has a role. And yeah. I think that's, for me, that's extremely important for us to get this right. I, I'm, I'm happy to work with you on it. I, I will just say honestly that I sometimes have seen, I think this is particularly true on Sound Island, um, and not to say that the process can't be faster and easier, but it's expensive to build streets up to the standards that are required for a map roadway. And I think a lot of developers don't necessarily, uh, you know, they kind of balk at that expense. So, you know, there's process improvements, but it does raise the cost when you build a map street that has the proper drainage, the proper quality, you know, all the things we would look for in a, in a city street. Right. So just, just, just and I and, and understood and I, and I appreciate that. And obviously costs are always uh, important. Um, and something we, we, we need to, to discuss and address. So you said you DOT is involved when there's a, a, a request for a waiver, right? So that that's the that request for you to get involved comes from BSA or you, you see the application and you respond. Yeah, I guess I how is that how is your agency involved in you know just a, a regular BSA uh, waiver request. Yeah, I th and, I, and I, I'm going to have to get back to you. I want to make, I'm not sure I'm totally immersed in the, the weeds of the details. I think the requests go to BSA. They come to DOT for our sign off. We have sort of a bunch of criteria that we double check. And look, as you know, because this has happened, you know, several times on Staten Island, that process can become very, you know, very contentious, very complicated. Um, and, and certainly, I think, stands room for improvement. Okay. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but Rebecca, I thought I should, did you have, oh, she's on mute. Can someone uh, on mute Rebecca Zach? If you don't mind, Commissioner, I think Rebecca had a- Yeah, Rebecca- No, I, I, was, I was just gonna say, Council Member, that I, or I can follow up with you on all your questions about um, the mapping request, uh, the well, mapping just, process and the, the mapping waiver. request. We get about four or five requests a year. I just okay, four or five, okay. That. Oh, okay. Not that many. Okay. Um, so listen, I, I we're, we're trying to you know pardon the pun, but 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 come up with this correct roadmap of going forward. And and again, I, I know you don't have um, a lot of substance to talk about, but there are a lot of details in this bill that we're going to have to all come together and follow up because I think it's incumbent on us to get this process right, even with all these issues because. Um, the issues we're seeing now with private streets and constituents, constituent issues with private streets, not to mention, um, you know, if, if waivers aren't going to be um, approved, we have to come up with, with the right plan. And uh, I'm, I'm committed. I know the borough president obviously is committed. I want to thank him for his leadership on, on this issue um, and understanding the, the complexity of this issue. I know his office will will provide some testi testimony later on, but it's something that we really need to come together and, and sit and discuss uh, the details. And I, I hope that you're committed to do that with, with Borough President Otto, myself, and, and, and the rest of the stakeholders. Indeed. 
and, and I appreciate the, the beginning conversation of this. Obviously, a lot more to talk about. So thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, to lead off the, the hearing with my thoughts and questions. Uh, I'll send it back to you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Member. So let, let me get into a few questions, and then I know that all my colleagues, they also have raised a hand to ask questions. Commissioner, I'm pretty sure that this has been a new experience, the one of creating the opening suite. And I know that there is also required for you and your team to work in collaboration with all the agencies, you know, Park, NYPD, SBS. So what what is the mechanism that the city has right now led by you, DOT, when it comes to open a street and what mechanism mechanism are, is in place to do the assessment of how the programming is working and have any initial assessment have been made identifying how the program is working, the challenges and the opportunity for this program to be permanent in our city. Um, I, I think I'll talk, Mr. Chairman, a little bit about sort of open streets, and I think you were also alluding to open restaurants. And look, no question, as I said in my testimony, um, both sets of programs involved a lot of agency players, as well as community groups, bids, business associations, and thank you so many of you on the council who've shown such great leadership and partnership. I, you know, I was sort of joking particularly about open restaurants because, you know, prior to COVID, DOT, was not really in the restaurant business and, and now we are. Um, and you know, it, it's involved breaking down a lot of silos and I think forming some really good relationships with sister agency on open streets. And again, we, we thank the council for this and the advocates and, and, and Speaker Johnson for really pushing the city to envision a new model. You know, as I like to say, a much more nimble model, much less labor intensive, you know, did not have what had traditionally been the city's approach to open streets, which was to have a lot of NYPD sort of manning the barricades. Um, and I think that's been a breakthrough. Um, and look, you know, I, there are certainly places where it's worked better than others. And we're going to be producing for you all, I think, sort of a list of places where we saw big success. And I guess we're measuring success by popular usage. Sites are well maintained. You know, we're hearing good feedback from the community. But obviously, we'll, we'll take any input you all have on that. And, and some places where, frankly, we didn't see great success, where they were not well used by the community, particularly as playgrounds and summer camps opened up. I think some of the sites started to become less used. We noticed that the barricades, you know, were sort of drifting away. So we will sort of be sharing with you all our assessment of that. But clearly it's a whole new model. It did involve PD and FDNY, but also Parks Department, DOT, and as I said, a lot of local community groups. I think going forward, um, we're gonna be talking about how we design that program in a more permanent way. And of course, we wanna work closely with you all in that design. On open restaurants, this was definitely new territory uh, for DOT in New York City. And again, wanna thank the council and, and council member Reynoso, um, you know, for really working with us, I think to go big. I don't know that I've heard of any other city that has done the, the amount of you know, roadway and sidewalk dining that we have done in such a short amount of time. And it also, you know, produced, I think, a very fruitful um, partnership again with us, with Small Business Services, with, with Commissioner John L. Doris, who's, as many of you know, on the front lines of trying to help small businesses, uh, with the Mayor's Office of Movies and Entertainment, the Office of Nightlife, the Sheriff, you know, on the sort of the enforcement and compliance side, the Sheriff's Office, NYPD, we even for a time had Department of Buildings pitching in to help us. So, you know, another area where the whole city family came together. Um, I've gotten a tremendously good response. Nice to see you sitting out at a restaurant. And, you know, the mayor has already announced, you know, we're extending potentially the program even further into this year and starting it up again next year. Another area where, again, we want to work with you all to codify the details, but um, it has been a true interagency partnership and, and I think a really fruitful one. Not to mention Hospitality Association, New York State, Latino restaurant owners, like a lot of other industry players as well, and individual restaurateurs who brought their input, their leadership, their enthusiasm. Thank you. Well, as, as you could see again, I'm here at Dagman and Broadway, not yet sitting in the restaurant, but just to be sure that we can highlight 
you know, one of the models that we have in our city where, you know, closing this block, we gave more opportunity to pedestrians, cyclists, residents of this community and the restaurant to use this common space. And I think that, and, and I appreciate again, as I have said, you know, I know that it's more easy to go and go after things that we disagree or go after, you know, in this particular time, uh, the administration that has a lot of challenges instead of comparing where we were before and all the advancement that we have been able to make. So I'm all about focusing about things that we can accomplish, especially in the last couple of months that we have ahead of us in this administration, because we don't know what type of mentality whoever will come to office in January 22, they will have about making the city more pedestrian and cyclist friendly. So what, what is your goal when it came to, and of course, and as you know, I know about and I appreciate, you know, how you think Rebecca and the rest of you guys are working to be sure also that the, the, the institution that are here in Dagman, they can get information to see how can they start applying to turn these areas a permanent plaza. But more than it's a local uh, model, uh, is the city, is DOT now looking to expand, you know, the opportunity to create more plaza uh, as, as, you know, as a way to have a better use of our street? And, and, and look, I, I just, you know, because you're sitting there on, on Dykeman and obviously I've gotten to know the restaurateurs uh, on that, that particular block. And again, I just want to thank, I mean, I think one thing that, you know, particularly those of us in the transportation business didn't know what we were getting into in some ways. And to see the energy and the creativity of the restaurant community in New York City and just the beautiful spaces they've created. And look, we would concede, you know, early on in the program, there were some bumps as we got things set up and made sure it was safe. But I think in in recent weeks, we have seen just beautiful outdoor setting and the ability to do it on closed streets in particular has proved so popular. I'm glad you're doing it on Dykeman, uh, right near where I live in Brooklyn on, on Vanderbilt Avenue. It's become a beautiful place where people not only eat in the restaurants, but just come out and have picnics. Uh, it, it's, it has really transformed the public space. And of course, Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, and the mayor has, I think, been very enthusiastic and hands-on on, on this program and, and is really pushing us not only to find ways to expand it, but to make sure, as you mentioned, that next year we have a permanent structure in place. You know, we, we will be working very closely with you and the council on this, as well as, again, I think all our sister agencies, civic groups, bids, and private sector partners who we could not have done all this without them. Hey. Commissioner, what about, uh, as you know, that when we look at sidewalk, uh, one of the things that I, I know that I also have a conversation with your team, and I'm hoping, again, I know that there is a bill that uh, I don't want to, you know, ask it right now, do you support it, yes or no, because, you know, I don't, that bill is not part of this, but one of the things that I want to do is to be sure that everything to sidewalk is led by DOT. Because right now, when there's many, when some questions are related to sidewalk, sometimes it's Department of Buildings, sometimes it involves the Department of Sanitation, it involves the Department of Consuming Affairs. But one of the things that I can tell you that is happening in the Sur community is also that the issue of sidewalk, especially related to so many garbage can full and, and no one going there to pick it up especially in, 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 in the low income community. It's like a everyday experience. Uh, is DOT working by any chance in coordination with the Department of Sanitation to be sure that what is happening in lower community, because I'm pretty sure that that doesn't happen in the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side. The issue of so many garbage cans full for days in our street is an issue that should not be a concern of only or the Department of Sanitation, but also the Department of Transportation because of the role that the agency have when it comes to be sure that sidewalk are clean, that sidewalk are, you know, a, a, a always a, a used by pedestrians. So what is your, any conversation between you, sanitation to address with this issue? Yes, and, and I think you also, prior to the pandemic, and I'm gonna confess, I'll have to have the staff check on exactly where things are right now. And obviously we're sadly losing my, my dear friend and, and colleague at sanitation as of yesterday, but 
we were putting together a pilot project where we were gonna work with local bids to potentially create, as some of you may have seen, if you've, you've been to Europe, I think you can see them in Spain and, uh, and in London and other places, put, you know, hopefully attractive garbage collection systems that would be in the street, not on the sidewalk. Um, we were putting together a pilot project to start looking at doing that here in New York. Um, again, I'm gonna check on the status of it. Obviously a lot of things uh, got on hold during the, you know, the, the bad months of coronavirus. But we certainly think that that's something the city should be doing more of. And we know that would make the sidewalks more attractive, give people more room for access, potentially, you know, consolidate the garbage, put it in a spot where, you know, it's, it's more out of the way. Um, and I think we're still keen to have that, to have that pilot uh, unfold. But again, I'm just, maybe someone will double check for me. I think maybe the RFP was just about to go out, but we'll have someone double check. Okay. And, and I have a, just one more question. All of my colleagues also is waiting for as a question. It's about buses and, and, and use, you know, you spoke uh, on relation to why you've been doing coordination with MTA when it comes to the buses. But as you know, one of the things that we've been advocating for the council is to uh, the DOT to put more technology across the five boroughs so that the buses they will have priority when they cross when they cross intersections. Are are you you know the agency take looking at this and see how we can make progress since buses became you know uh, so important especially during this pandemic. Yes, and 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 as I, I said in my testament again, I want to I want to thank the council and you, Mr. Chairman, and, and the advocacy community for pushing us on how we could be faster and more efficient in installing TSP transit signal priority, as you say, to let those buses go faster down streets, get a head start through intersections. I'll admit we had a we had a process that was that you know because we were doing very careful engineering um, that was taking too long and we weren't sort of having the output we needed. This year, even despite the pandemic, we've done transit signal priority at 300 locations, which was actually more than we thought we would get to this year, and we're going to continue. So, I think we've probably picked up that pace almost tenfold. Uh, and you know, again, while, while not sacrificing the good engineering and making sure that we're installing the technology, you know, in intersections and parts of the city where we know it can do the most good. Okay. And 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 I'm sorry on this. What is DOT? How is DOT looking at the issue related to? And I just went back to Open Street, especially with a restaurant, uh, uh, with with the restaurant, with the whole things about uh, being sure that as restaurant they use sidewalk and space in the street. What about the safety of pedestrians? Seeing few crashes happen have happened in the last couple of weeks. I, how is the agency? Uh, assuring that uh, the business owner, also the restaurant owner, that they also put the necessary measure in place in order to protect uh, those who sit in their in their in their business. Yeah, it, it's a good question. And again, I think part of early on when we started the program, and, and at the behest of the council, and certainly at the mayor's direction, we created a self-certification process that I think was among the quickest uh, I've ever heard of. I think one of the downsides and something we learned along the way is I think for a lot of restaurants, they really didn't understand the guidance about how to create a, a safe setup in the street and what you needed to do to make it sturdy. And so admittedly, we sort of had to go back and retool uh, and make sure we have now done, I think it's 14,000 um, inspections and visits to restaurants. We've done an online tutorial. We're doing all kinds of hands-on coaching uh, helping restaurants know, and we've done it in multiple languages, helping restaurants know how to build and design a safe setup in the street. Um, and I have to say, I, I think, you know, certainly we've seen some incidents, you know, luckily nothing serious, but I've seen, you know, as I've walked the streets and talked to restaurateurs over the past couple of months, a big evolution in how much restaurants have improved their setups and made them safer. I would say to you council members, if you see places and we, we do need, this is such a big program, it's hard for us to manage it without you all being our eyes and ears. If you see in your districts, places where you have concerns, where you think restaurants are not doing a good job, they need a tutorial, they need us to come out and help them, please, please come to our borough commissioner's offices, tell us, and we will be there again, not to find them, not to punish them, 
but to have our experts come and help them, in, you know, explain in whatever language we need to explain how to build a safe setup, what kind of materials to use, etc. We very much want to work closely with restaurants. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Rebecca, and the rest of the team. And now let's go to the council that they have questions. I will go back to the team so that they call the colleague and give them the opportunity. We are giving five minutes each and, and the team who is on control or whoever is having raising the hand, they're gonna be calling uh, the council member based on the order that they, are, that they raise their hand. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Uh, first, we have also been joined by council members Rose, Richards and Rivera. Uh, we'll now call on council members in the order that they have used the Zoom raised hand function. Uh, council members, uh, as the chair noted, please keep your questions to five minutes. The sergeant at arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Uh, council, council member Cabrera will be first. His hand was raised previously before being lowered by staff. Uh, council member Cabrera will be followed by council members Reynoso and Ku. Uh, council member Cabrera. Thank you so much. And I want to thank uh, the chair uh, and commissioner. Thank you. And also, uh, Commissioner Navarro, right here in the Bronx, uh, during COVID-19 uh, for uh, every issue that we brought up uh, was uh, given uh, physician attention. So I want to I want to thank you for that and for your leadership. I wanted to ask you about a couple of things you cover uh, quite a bit in your opening statement. Uh, but I wanted to ask you uh, three quick questions. Number one was in regards to uh, how we doing with the uh, micromobility e-scooters, uh, e, uh, October 15, RFP, I know it's supposed to come out, uh, so we're looking about a month from now. Second question I had was in regards to uh, just a follow-up regarding restaurants uh, that the chair mentioned, very concerned. Uh, about our, our restaurants. And if you're having any conversation, I would love to know if you're having direct conversations with the governor's office. I think we need to finally allow people to go inside in the restaurants. People right here in the Bronx, they just jump into Westchester County. I, I literally could drive an hour away. And I'm right there. Anybody could just jump. So we're losing millions of dollars uh, a lot of my people work in the restaurant business, people from my district. Uh, so I'm very curious to know if something's going to happen. Because realistically, people are not going to be out there in the freezing cold uh, trying to have a nice meal, especially in the evening. Uh, it just, it's unrealistic. Uh, so I'm curious to know if, you, if you're getting uh, any type of... Uh, hints as to what the state is going to do and also uh, uh, from uh, the administration here. And the last question, if you can, is uh, in regards to the impact of COVID-19 on the capital projects, uh, specifically like rezoning, for example, in Jerome Avenue rezoning or any other rezonings that took place. And I know that you had a lot of capital projects coming out line, do things speed up, do they stay the same, other projects that are uh, in, in just place in a hole? All right, Th thank you, Councilmember Cabrera, good to see you. I'll, I'll take each of your questions in turn, uh, starting with e-scooters. And I did reference them in my testimony. Um, the solicitation is supposed to come out mid-March, and I, uh, I mean, uh, excuse me, mid-October, and we're on track to do that. but. Overall, we are going to be challenged to run this program. And I, I wanna talk a little bit about why um, and sort of put this back on the council to think about. Um, we are right now, I'm proud to say, we have been the summer, you know this, uh, you're up in the Bronx. We've been working on you know, a massive expansion of city bike, both up into Northern Manhattan, into the Bronx. We're doing infill in Manhattan. Um, that has taken a lot of staff bandwidth. On top of that, I think a lot of you know, this summer, um, with the fatalities and the safety issues with Revel, my agency is now going to be taking a much bigger role in overseeing and regulating them. Uh, and I think to do an e-scooter pilot well, we also want to make sure that we have the bandwidth, the people, the resources, <coughs> excuse me, 
to manage it well. We don't want a pilot where things aren't safe or scooters are being scattered all over the streets. So I, I just sort of flag for the committee. Um, in the current budget crisis that we're in, we really have a, a challenge here. I don't really have the personnel, uh, I think, to do all these programs as well as I'd like to. We're not gonna resolve that today, but I just wanna flag for you all. Um, it's a real issue. Micromobility, to do it well, to, to track the data, to make sure it's safe and orderly, to respond to community concerns and questions as we always have with these programs, that does require personnel and resources. But, but we will be getting the solicitation out uh, next month. On the indoor dining and speaking to the state, I would say that I would just, I'm, I'm sorry to say that one is kind of above my pay grade. Um, you know, DOT's role has obviously been in trying to do the best we can with outdoor space. I know that the mayor's office and city hall has been in discussions with the governor's office, but I, I'm, I'm not able, unfortunately, to characterize uh, where those stand. I certainly know myself from talking to many restaurants, from talking to Andrew Ridgey from the, from the Hospitality Association, obviously what a, what a big issue this is. And I know the mayor has said in recent days that he is taking a look at it this month. So Inspired. obviously we'll certainly convey that it's, it's high on you. And we, and we certainly know we're hearing it obviously in Staten Island and Queens and the Bronx, you know, parts of the city where neighboring jurisdictions are allowing indoor dining that, that restaurants can see, uh, you know, that it feels especially unfair. So we hear you on that. On capital projects, um, you know, in addition to the big, you know, budget cuts that we're experiencing on the expense side of the city's budget, basically our operating budget, you know, we are certainly going to be slowing down capital spending. And I think largely pushing projects out into out years. And some of you who are here in the Bloomberg years kind of know that that's what happened back about 10 years ago. You know, projects that were supposed to happen in this fiscal year got, got pushed out a couple of fiscal years. We're certainly looking at that process right now. Um, and that, I, again, I think it's gonna be another dialogue with the council, um, with a lot of big capital needs that the city has, how do we best prioritize in the years to come? And, you know, again, I think that will also very much de be dependent on what happens at the federal level. If there's local aid for city and states, if we perhaps have a change in administration, it's no secret that the, uh, you know, if, if, if it's um, Vice President Biden, he's a big, enthusiastic believer in infrastructure. Um, and I think, you know, potentially maybe we would see more uh, resources at the federal level. Well, I'll run out of time, uh, Commissioner. Uh, if we could have a uh, offline conversation about the e-scooters. Uh, I know we gave, uh, part of the negotiation was to give that extra time that you needed. So we'd love to uh, have that conversation uh, so we could be uh, in the same page, I, but I, I literally run out of time. Yeah, no, and I, I would be happy to have that conversation. I do just want to say we flagged at the time. We needed the time, but we, we did also need resources to, to manage this program well. But uh, Council Member Cabrera, happy to have that uh, discussion offline. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member Cabrera. Uh, next, we will hear from Council Member Reynoso, followed by Council Member Ku and Cohen. Uh, Council Member right. Reynoso. Time begins now. Thank you so much. Uh, just want to uh, thank the commissioner for, for being here. I've been joined by my son, Alejandro, um, who wants me to make slime with him. Uh, I don't know how successful we were, but, but we were trying to make it happen out here. Um, one second. Uh, I wanted to ask a question regarding uh, the outdoor dining. And I just want to thank you because I actually think it's been a great success. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we limited uh, the chefs in the kitchen when it came to how exactly that was going to get done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it as diplomatic as possible. Um, and I hope, uh, Commissioner, that you see the value of allowing for, you know, these businesses um, that want to do right by the city of New York and that are just trying to survive. Um, what happens when the city just allows for some folks to, 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 to try to figure it out on their own? and limit so much input to, to the level of paralysis and a lot of the work that we need to get done. I wanna move out of that type of work, um, not only in the restaurants area, but everywhere else, like bike lanes, where we know they are um, increase safety and allow for more safety. Um, they build infrastructure, encourages more bike ridership, everything that you already know, Commissioner. Um, if you were to have the same type 
of, uh, I guess, standards or process for that that you do with restaurants, then we would be a different city already. Um, so I just want to give you that. Um, and, and you did it against all politics. There were a lot of members that were very concerned about the lack of input from, let's say, community boards related to the open dining. And I would, I would argue that there's not one council member that's going to get up and say that that was a problem. Um, they, are all, they are now happy and it's been successful with literally you know, tinkering in the edges. We were able to make that a very successful program because of your work, um, but also because um, we allowed, we just kind of let data and experts uh, take, take that on. So I just want to let you know that I thank you for that and hope that you use that model more often. Uh, City bike. Uh, a lot of members have, they saw one, they saw one case where we had a long standing restaurant that needed a movement of a city bike dock um, to be able to use outdoor dining. And look, we're New Yorkers, we want everybody to succeed and we want to figure out ways that we can make that happen in a meaningful way. But I want to treat the city bike docks the way we treat bus stops, right? We have to note that City bike is transportation infrastructure, meaningful transportation infrastructure that moves a lot of us around um, when we need it. And if we're just going to start moving these docks at the behest of uh, businesses or, 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 or individual uh, uh, people, uh, then I think it's gonna be a problem because we're gonna be moving a lot of these stations. Uh, people are gonna start forgetting where they were or having to move their, their work around, but ultimately, uh, are, is it public transportation or is it not? And we gotta finally be very clear with the general public um, about what city bike is. So I wanna be very clear that I think that we should have a, a process um, when it comes to moving docks that is that is very, that's tougher, I guess, um, or that we think about it perm uh, as, as permanent infrastructure. Um, and then the, I'm sorry, uh, Oh, the open streets. First, Berry Street should be a uh, busway both ways. No cars, uh, just buses, express buses. Uh, whatever the BQX wanted to do in bus format, I think it's the way we need to make that happen. And I really think that I just want you to know I endorse it. Um, so, and I only got one more minute. I'm making a lot of comments and suggestions that you already know because we talk so much. Um, and then also, yes, the, the movement of my, the bike racks concern me because it means that you're not moving other bike racks into communities, right? Because those trucks are not having to pick them up, move them to another location when those trucks will be bringing in new docks and putting them in the Bronx um, and expanding them out in Brooklyn or in Queens. So I just want to make sure that we use our resources wisely and that we don't succumb to, to, to anecdotes and, and public pressure that doesn't, that's not related to data. Uh, and Outside of that, oh, moving temporary bus stops on North Strand Ave is still something I really want to talk to you about. Uh, but I, I, I really, think we fixed, we, I think we fixed your the one on North Strand Avenue. No, I think you fixed one on Fulton, but it's okay. The, the, it's, we'll catch up. But I, I, I do want to say, Nost I thought Claudette said we fixed North Strand as well. I thought so too. I'll follow up with her. Yeah, that's okay. what she told me last time you reached out to me on it and she was going to call you but sorry uh, I can't, expired. Okay. take all your questions in order no it's okay as of now um i got a call back from the businesses and they said that there wasn't there wasn't any movement oh um, okay well check. that's but, not but what for i me, all right we'll check on that council member but, but for me it's mostly to to let you know that i'm really grateful of the work that you've done i always think we can do more because i think we're a great city and we talk about exceptionalism that's what i think about is doing more but I don't want to take away from the fact that we've expanded the restaurant work, that we've done the streets, uh, the closed street, oh, the open streets. And I think we should do more of that. Maintenance of that is what I really want to talk about. Uh, I, my, my community is putting up their own barricades, fixing barricades, uh, barricades that are being hit by cars, barricades that are being moved by cars. And I just think if we had a more, a more, a more sustainable um, system uh, that, that, the open safe streets would be something that my residents would like even more. Uh, but outside of that, thank you very much. And I'm sorry that um, I took so much time, uh, but I really appreciate it. And, uh, and I saw that bit of commissioner beaten with his child as well. Beautiful. Uh, it's nice to see family on, on these Zoom chats. These are parts of our lives that we would never be able to see. Um, and it really humanizes the work that we do. Um, I love you all dearly um, and peace. All right. Well, well thank you, council member. I'll, I'll and it is certainly nice to see Alejandro. I seem to remember a, 
town hall, I think, in which you proudly announced you were going to be a father. And uh, look at you now, what a beautiful boy. It is, I agree with you, it is fun to actually get a glimpse of people's children and their cats and their dogs and their spouses. And uh, we do see a little side of each other that um, we didn't know before the, the pandemic. Let me sort of take- um, and Commissioner, I'm about to have a second baby, so just a heads up. Oh, congratulations. Six, well, not, not me, my wife is about to have a second baby. So I'm six months, six months, so there you go. We, we, it's strange, during, during COVID, we've had a bit of a baby <laughs> boom at New York City DOT. Oh, okay. born. Uh, I, and we've had in, in our time in our office, three sets of twins. So we're a twin <laughs> factory here, just in case anyone wants to come work here who wants twins. Or not. Um, <laughs> just to talk a little bit about what you said. And first of all, obviously I want to start on open restaurants by thanking you for your leadership. You have been a terrific partner. You were on this issue from day one and you know it was terrific to work with you on the council and the codifying the program and getting the unanimous support of your colleagues, I think really made a big difference. And, you know, I hear what you're saying. We, you know, for, for open restaurants, we did, we sort of threw out all the traditional city processes and you're correct that it was a big leap of faith. And some of your colleagues and many people out in the city were worried about, we're not letting community board sign off and, you know, we're not having architectural drawings and all the things we traditionally, oh, look, we're still working through it. You heard, Council member, you know, Rodriguez asked, are we sure it's safe? I mean, you know, this has been a real work in progress. The old cliche that we're, uh, we're building the airplane as we fly it has, has definitely been true. Um, and I understand, I think I'm hearing it from all quarters. Why can't we do more of that with bike lanes and bus lanes? Why can't we throw out some of our traditional procedures? I, you know, I'll sort of put it back a little bit on the council. Um, a lot of what we do with those projects requires uh, you know, working with community boards and notification processes, we have to do that, for example, for bike infrastructure, we have to give community boards a 45 day notification, that's a council mandate. So, I mean, I think we've learned a lot this summer about kind of changing the rules and, you know, I hear you. I think we would like to explore doing more of that on some of these other types of projects. I think open restaurants in particular has really, you know, to take a program, you know, from sort of, zero to 10,000 restaurants uh, in the span really of just a couple months. I think it's, it's certainly from where my agency sits, it's pretty unprecedented. And again, thank you, you know, for your leadership and vision on it. I wanna touch for a sec on the issue of the moving of the city bike docks. And you are right, we did move it in the case of one restaurant. It, it, it's a restaurant which I think, it is, it is no secret that, that the mayor, um, He's a lover of things that are, you know, very historic. And that was a hundred year old restaurant. We have generally not done that though. It has not been our practice to move city bike docks. Um, I'll not say that we never do it, but, but I think we do very much adhere to what you're saying. It's, it's only in very rare exceptions. And by the way, that can make many of your colleagues very unhappy. Um, so, you know, we, we, we've often been pretty strict about that and, and we intend to continue to be, but I, this is New York City and, and I've learned uh, now through seven years of experience, there are you know, occasionally exceptions to the rule, but in the case of moving city bike docks, as you say, as we're trying to expand further out into Manhattan, into the Bronx, into Brooklyn and Queens and add more docks into Manhattan so that folks from the outer boroughs will have a place uh, to park their bikes when they get into the center city, we're not in the business of doing too much moving of bikes, of, of docks. You and I had talked about Berry Street, and, and I will say I agree with you. It has been one of our most successful open streets. I've been out there. It is terrific. And, and you certainly raise, I think, the question that we've grappled with this summer, um, which is sort of the sustainability of maintenance. And that is a real challenge. Early on, again, I think a, a credit to the council and, and the speaker and the advocates for pushing the city to change our model for it no longer being a sort of NYPD heavy month. And that freed us up in ways that, you know, I will agree, we're overdue. We, we couldn't have done 75 miles of open streets if we'd had to have NYPD manning every barricade. But, you know, that has meant we're sort of trying to grapple with a new model. If we don't have city officials standing there all day long, we do require some degree of community engagement and involvement. And believe me, we totally recognize social capital and the ability to do that is not evenly distributed around the city and lower income communities, you know, and communities of color, that can often be harder to do. So, you know, we, we need to work with you all. We need to find a model, but 
I think we're all in agreement. The days of sort of having NYPD stand at every barricade, we're not gonna do that anymore. They don't have the bandwidth and the, the people power and neither do we. Um, and so, you know, working with community groups and you all, that, that's gonna be the model going forward. And there may be places where, where, you know, again, where there isn't that community resource, we're gonna have to work together to figure out how to keep you know, that system well-maintained, but, you know, particularly again, in a time of a real fiscal crisis, that's not an easy equation. As I said in my testimony, um, I'm already down 8% in terms of my vacancy rate in my agency. You know, if we don't get state borrowing authority, that, that could look a lot worse. You know, we don't have the same resources of people, I think in the next couple of years as, as we've had in the past. Um, but I, I guess I'll close by saying we, we recognize we need to find solutions. And we certainly, I, I know from the mayor on down, everybody wants to continue with open streets and open restaurants to make them safe, to make them accessible, and to make sure that they are in every neighborhood of the city, you know, regardless of how much resources that neighborhood has. Thank you. We will now hear from Council Member Ku, followed by Council Members Cohen and Holden. Councilmember Ku. Time begins now. Thank you. Commissioner Trottenberg, how are you? I'm well, council member. How are you? Yeah, I want to thank you for your for you and your uh, all the staff for the doing a, a very good job in leading the city in transportation issues. You know, transportation is one of the most important issues in any city. It's like our circulation in our body. So if you don't manage well, you have a stroke or you have a heart attack, you know. So um, uh, I have uh, two issues, two questions. Uh, one is the busway, which we talked about before, so I'm not gonna talk about it more uh, here, but you know, uh, New York City is a big city. Uh, uh, one size doesn't fit all. Uh, busway in other parts might work well, but it won't work in downtown fashion because we are different. We have so many supermarkets, doctor's office, you know, beauty salons, massage parlors, uh, all these special schools for coaching, uh, swimming, for tennis, for learning, SAT, all these things are family things. Family, uh, they all come, families come on one day to do all those things together, to shopping, to have a massage. So they spend a lot of time in fashion and they all come by car, you know. They spend half a day to a whole day here. Uh, that's why uh, these people create a lot of vitality for the local business. So that's the, my concern. Uh, so bus space is very important. We don't want it, uh, at least not for now, during the pandemic. Uh, people is so uncertain about the future. They don't have money to pay rent. So this morning I received a, a call from the landlord, a building landlord asking me whether they can invite a restaurant. Because he said, oh, the restaurant has been doing business for a long time for takeout. And they, they haven't been paying rent. And I said, hey, it's, it's now is not a good time to evict tenants, right? But he said, what about my, me? I have the, the landlord has to pay, I have a water bill to pay. It's a, a big water bill. And they, if they don't pay the water bill, the, the property tax, uh, city is gonna put a lien on the building, right? So this is a very difficult situation. So we want to make sure the city support all businesses. If you support the businesses, business owners, uh, the landowners will have income too, to pay your tax. So it's a circulation problem. One doesn't get money, the other one don't get money too. So this is how the economy works. So the best thing for the city to do is how to help all the business uh, to make money uh, to get back to normal uh, so that they can pay rent, pay tax, uh, and, uh, and et cetera. So my, th this is my, 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 my realm, right? The second part is uh, on my complaint is about the uh, open street restaurants. We have a lot of restaurants situated in the basements or third floor, second floor, in the, some more buildings or even in some uh, other buildings, office buildings. They might have a restaurant on the top floor as it does in, in the city and also in Queens here. So right now they, they, 
they cannot do any like open street dining because they're on the second floor, or third floor, or in the basement. So I, I, I want to like ask the city to find some ways for them uh, to operate at least take out, you know, some some mechanisms they can do on the street. Hey, you no, know, and then they can call upstairs, right, and they delete the food downstairs to them because they are forbidden to enter the building. Right now, that some malls are open now, but uh, I'm talking. I was talking about before, but they still have a they need a mechanism to to do business, uh, at least some business. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's uh, my second thing. I hope uh, you will find some ways to take care of it as soon as possible. Yeah, thank you. All right, Th thank you, council member. And, and thanks for talking me with, with me the other day about the busway. I don't, probably not a lot we'll, we'll agree on here today, but again, you have our commitment. We're gonna keep talking to you. And, and uh, you know, I, as you know, I was out there myself and, and heard loud and clear from many of the local business owners we have some town halls planned, so we're gonna and we're gonna be doing them in multiple languages, um, and we'll continue to take that input. Let's turn to that second question, which I, I know has been an issue out in Flushing and in other parts of the city. And I will say, when we got the open restaurants program open and running, I mean, one challenge we faced is how do we get something up as fast as we can to help as many restaurants as possible? There are about twenty-seven thousand restaurants in New York City, and as you say, in a bunch of different circumstances, on second floors, in malls some with tiny storefronts, some that do have the city bike or the bus stop or the fire hydrant in front of them. I think in this first round, you know, we tried to just open it up to, to restaurants that had space in front. And, and that's, again, helped 10,000 restaurants, not everybody, but I think a, a, you know, a good selection of restaurants. We are certainly talking right now in the city family and within city hall about how we get to that next group, you know, adjacent space and other ways that we can get more restaurants into the program. I know, again, that this is certainly a priority of the mayors. And I know, you know, we've been talking to you about some of the circumstances in Flushing and we'll continue to do so. I think 10,000 has been a great start. When we started the program, we thought it would only be 5,000. It's now more than double that, but we obviously would like to make it work for as many restaurants as we possibly can. And before before we go to the next colleague, I would like to say to the first part of, of the council member comment is that there's a guy that is responsible for the small business not getting the support that they need. And that guy is sitting there in Pennsylvania Avenue. You know, there's, there's, a, real, there's a real proposal when it comes to, you know, the city, especially the 11 New York City congressional delegation and, 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 and the whole Democratic congressional body asking for more federal support. And the guy has been holding that support. So I think that we have to be clear that a lot is in the, in the state when it comes to the future, not only of Washington, D.C., but also the future of the state in the city of New York, especially for the small business to get more financial support. And also, as you say, the property owner also to be able to get some support too to deal with the debt that they have. And when it comes to the a, a, a opening restaurant, I agree with the colleague, I, even though we're focusing on on open street, that's a merry of the, you know, the focus of this hearing today, but no doubt that we want for the city to continue opening more, not only opening restaurants at the capacity that keep the social distance and protect the safety of those who, the consumer, but also opening the indoor pool, opening other areas that are so important for our city. But I think that today we, we are focusing on, you know, what we have, which is the opening a street, the buses, the city bike, and all the infrastructure related to the transportation and how we've been doing so far when it comes to the agency responsibility uh, when it comes to the uh, COVID-19. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Council Member Cohen, followed by Council Members Holden and Rivera. Council Member Cohen. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, I got to tell you, though, I'm having a little trouble reconciling your testimony in, in, in response to Councilmember Matteo uh, and our own conversations that we've had about private streets in my district. Um, I, you know, I, I, my office somehow, even though everybody's working virtually, like I wrote you a letter in June of 2019 about uh, private street status. 
Um, and you sent me a letter back in November of 19 uh, with a lovely little handwritten note that you're trying to solve this, but there's been no progress. And it didn't sound to me in your answers to, and you were talking about a global solution for private streets. I know that you know, in the Bronx, we have the problem. In Queens, we have the problem. In Staten Island, it's obviously significant. I didn't hear anything that we actually made any progress. Like you were, I thought there was a plan coming out for how we were going to deal with these private streets. I have streets that were, you know, that are very, very old, that there may have been community associations set up at some point to maintain them. Nobody knows who they are. There are no records anymore. And I have constituents, you know, some of, and, and not that paying property tax should be dispositive here, but they are paying significant property tax and uh, it looks like a, a bomb went off on their streets. And we can't, you know, it, previously, we used to be able to get what they called strip paving. I've got nothing. The streets are really, really dangerous. And nobody seems to care. Well, I, I think um, I, I think I was sort of making that point to Council Member Matteo, and I certainly had you in mind that the, the issue of uh, private streets is in all five boroughs. Uh, it's not just a Staten Island phenomenon. And I think what we had talked about, and I'll admit, I think the city uh, sort of never came to a conclusion about it is, you know, do we potentially, for example, create a program? Th we're sort of talking about two separate problems. One is the sort of these legacy streets and how we can maintain them and perhaps get them up to standards. And then I think what Council Matteo is also talking about, which is going forward, how do we make sure perhaps that we don't add to the inventory that we, at least we don't make the hole any deeper uh, and that we don't add a lot more private streets to the city's inventory, knowing, as you pointed out, that as the years go by and the mists of time, whoever owned these streets, whichever developer, you know, built a crappy street has pocketed their profits and, and left the scene. I, I think what we had talked about, and again, I, I think this is, you know, something for the council to grapple with, you know, as you and I discussed, it's a lot of money um, to fix all these streets. You know, one could potentially envision a program um, where you would evaluate them all, you would sort of pick the ones that are in the worst condition, you know, perhaps in the lowest income neighborhoods, uh, you know, and create some kind of a pool to start repairing them. I'll admit, I think we, we talked about that idea and it didn't come to fruition. You know, we, we do, um, and happy, to, you know, in the streets you're talking about, there are cases where we can do, you know, some minor repairs, but one of the challenges we have just because we're talking agency budgeting right now, is if it's not a map street, I can't use city capital funds to do the work. I have to use my expense funds, my operating funds. As I said in my testimony, I've already seen my operating funds uh, cut by 12%, $125 million, and, and more cuts to come. So just a, a problem which was already a, a sort of a challenge for us financially is, is even a more severe challenge now. But Look, I think I'm, you know, from you and your colleague, you know, there's no doubt that the city has not come up with a good solution for these streets. I think in part because it is just an enormous expense to do so. I, I mean, is, is is your testimony that's you know, as time winds down, my time is winding down maybe sooner than others, but this is a problem we're going to kick down the road to the next administration. I mean, again, I, I sort of put it back to you all. I mean, is this a problem we want to, you know, in this sort of time of fiscal challenge, dedicate some resources to? I mean, I think in the past, it sort of, we haven't done that, but, you know, not, that, that's, I think, a sort of a budgetary discussion, uh, you know, for all parties to have. I think there's no question, obviously, if we can get borrowing authority up in Albany or, you know, some kind of federal relief that will make some of these you know, some of these fiscal challenges are a little easier. I don't think we can, you know, we know the answer I, of how that's going to turn out at the moment. I suspect that there are scenarios if we, if we acquired title to these streets, then they could be capital eligible. Um, but and again, but, but I'm, you know, we, we can't acquire title until the streets are improved up to our standards. That's the by law. It, yeah, you have, you have, that, yes, I mean, that's the city doesn't take them into our inventory until they've achieved our standards. I mean, I, it's, it's the situation is a mess and it's dangerous. Um, people don't have, you know, it, it's in terms of emergency vehicles. I, I can't tell you how frustrated I am that this is, you know, that we just have not made any progress going, you know, with a plan to go forward on this. 
Uh, it, it, Chair, if you'll indulge me for just one more second, I just wanted to say on uh, on street dining, uh, I am impressed about how well, you know, I will concede, uh, I was one of the people concerned about having community involvement uh, in the rollout of this program uh, to Council Member Reynoso's point, and it's true that by and large, um, uh, I think it has been incredibly successful. Uh, I will say, and I think it's been addressed, uh, the one challenge I've gotten is actually from restaurant owners about compliance with conflicting regulations, and uh, you know that, and inspections where, you know, in the morning FDN uh, the fire department would come, in the afternoon DOT would come, and there would be conflicting, uh, you know, rules about how to be in compliance, uh, and that was really a challenge. And sometimes they were getting fined, uh, but I, it's my understanding I think that there's been some. Uh, relief on that front. Well, let me respond to that. And just to be clear, the city has not fined, we haven't, DOT has not fined any restaurants for roadway setups. I, I will concede your, your point, council member, and I, I certainly apologize for it again, as we were flying the plane as we were building it. I, I think, as I said, in response to a question, one thing perhaps we weren't prepared for is when restaurants went out into the streets, a lot of them clearly did not understand our guidance about how to set up safely. And I'll admit, we mobilized very quickly we brought in sister agencies to help us. I'm appreciative, uh, you know, FDNY and Department of Buildings and DEP to do the inspections. I know there were probably a period of a few weeks where restaurants were, were hearing from a lot of city officials. And I apologize for that. The goal was to try and get everything as safe as possible. And I'm happy to say the overwhelming majority of restaurants, I'd say within those few weeks, got good setups that are safe. And I think the program has been pretty smooth since then. Now, I will admit there's also state inspectors coming. That side of the house we don't control, but the state liquor authority, it's no secret, has been out. Um, I can't speak to their efforts, but on the city side, I think, you know, with the scramble to get the program up and running, there were definitely some growing pains and, and we apologize for that. But I think now, I, I'd probably say at least for the past month and a half, things have been running pretty smoothly. And, you know, again, if you have restaurants who feel like they have questions, concerns, they're, they're getting inspectors coming, please, you can always obviously come to us, come to the borough commissioner's offices and, and we will troubleshoot. And, and I, I will just say to your point, I know you were a bit of a skeptic about whether we would sort of just do this without the community boards and, and, and thank you for acknowledging it's worked well. And I wanna say we have, even though we have not done a, a formal community board process, we have of course been in communication with community boards, with you council members, with civic groups, I mean, we have certainly tried, even absent that formal process, to, to work as closely as we can with all of you. And we do appreciate in a lot of cases, you all have been great leaders and help troubleshoot and, and mediate. So I, I think even without that formal process, it's, it's been a good partnership. I, I can't argue with you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Next, we will hear from Council Member Holden, followed by Council Members Rivera and Levin. Uh, I'm sorry, I guess we just, uh, go ahead, Councilor Holden. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Time begins. Thank you, Commissioner, for all your hard work. Uh, the restaurant rollout, the open streets was terrific. I was a skeptic. I've never seen the city operate so well on, on a program, so I wanna thank you uh, and your staff. I, I know it was a difficult task. Um, I just, I don't wanna beat a dead horse, uh, Commissioner, but I wanna talk about private streets because you know that's a concern I brought up to you before. Mm -hmm. um, and I have some particular um, ideas for it, um, if you'll uh, allow me. Um, you know, obviously most private streets are, are next to a city map street. So they have an impact on city streets. Obviously there's no drainage. Like I have a street behind me on a hill. It's not a map street. There's no catch basin. So we have a river in any kind of rainstorm, thunderstorm coming down into obviously a map street so into into catch basins um, on on map streets so they do have a direct impact in fact many of the private streets don't have um curbs and sidewalks mm -hmm. um uh, nor we're catch basins. so we're, we're in a we're in a kind of catch 22 here because i promise the the, the constituents that we'll try to get them relief uh we'll try to do something with that um and each year goes by, and I've been doing this since I was a civic president, way before, 30 years ago, before I was a, a councilman, um, 
we've been trying to address this and we keep banging our heads against the wall. We did have a creative, uh, I think it was a Queens commissioner, Tony Pasulo, who even on city map streets where there were no, you know, um, curbs or sidewalks, he would install them. In fact, we still have what Tony Pasulo installed 30 years ago, right across the street from my house, he installed a, um, a metal curb that still exists today in-house. It was all done in-house because there were no curbs. And so he installed that and it works. So we have to get creative possibly in improving some of the streets, whether they're mapped or otherwise. But I do have mapped streets, Commissioner, without sidewalks, many of them without sidewalks or curbs. And I can't understand that in the 21st century. We're improving streets over and over again. We're building new curves. We're fixing curves. We're fixing sidewalks. When some in my community don't, never had one, never had a curb or a sidewalk. So I, I would just like to know, is there any plan, not only to address the, and I know you mentioned uh, uh, obviously um, the private streets, but improvement on just city streets. Um, why today that we don't have uh, curbs or, or sidewalks on many of my streets that are city map streets? All right, well, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. And, and thank you, council member, uh, for your kind words on restaurants. If, if you are a doubter and, and we made you uh, a bit of a believer, then uh, I consider that high praise really to the team uh, for their good work. Um, I, I think quite frankly, and this is a challenge, again, I'm, I'm gonna sort of bring it back to you all too. I, I think in a lot of ways, the, the challenge you're talking about is a budgetary one at this point. Um, you know, the, the cost of, you know, particularly for a map street, as you say, you know, to bring a, 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 a private street, you know, into the state of good repair of a map street. But you're saying for most of these, that means installing drainage systems and sidewalks. It's very, very expensive. Um, and I think, you know, it has been a question of priorities. And again, I think something we need to talk to the council about, particularly now you know, as the city's capital's budget, we have made a lot of big commitments, as you all know, in recent years in the city's capital budget, big projects, um, jails and coastal resiliency. And, you know, for example, in, in Southeast Queens, a, a part of the city, very prone to flooding, massive new efforts to install uh, water and sewer infrastructure, um, big school, but just, just, I think a lot of big capital needs that the city has, you know, I'm hearing from a lot of you and, and perhaps you know, this requires more conversation uh, offline. You know, you think that particularly, I think for the worst of these private streets, we need to make them a higher priority. And I yeah, I've got, I'm not even talking, let's, let's put aside the private streets because you did mention, you know, that there are challenges, but certainly city streets, map streets that don't have sidewalks and curbs or some catch bases should be a priority. I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, we, we should have some kind of regular program. Just before my time expires, I just want to get in one. Uh, I know you said your workforce was down 8%, um, and it was uh, a lot of the budget and the COVID, certainly. Um, do we, can we expect even longer waits? Because I'm waiting three years for uh, speed bumps. I'm waiting uh, three years, uh, almost- Time three, expired. Almost three years for traffic signal timing improvements um turning lanes improvements so that were mistakes and now it's taking years to correct uh so i got a host of issues that seem to be going nowhere and w what's going on in my district is that i have a lot of um backup traffic because of these issues uh and causing more pollution and frustration even during the COVID. so uh, i want to work with with your office but i there are certain simple fixes that i think we could do without waiting years thank you commissioner uh, and I'll just say, Councilmember Holden, you know, happy to go through that list with you. But to answer your question writ large, yes, there are going to be longer waits for everything. Okay. Um, you. you know, a a twelve percent cut in my expense budget, uh, and you know, already down eight percent in my workforce with more coming. And particularly for my agency, remember, I'm a very complicated agency with a lot of different pro. I'm not going to take, you know deckhands from the Staten Island Ferry and have them go do traffic signals. I have a lot of different pots and programs and, you know, those kind of cuts, it's a deep impact. I, I, I don't want anyone to be misled about that. And, and I'm afraid, unfortunately, everyone's going to feel it a bit as, as we're seeing in other things in garbage collection and all kinds of things. You know, we were very fortunate in the city. We had basically 10 years of budget growth and it, it meant, you know, we were able to accomplish a lot of things. And, 
And now obviously we're in a much more difficult fiscal situation. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Councilmember Rivera, followed by Councilmember Rose. Councilmember Rivera. Time begins now. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. I'm going to blaze through these um, as much as I can, and thank you for all your answers uh, thus far. So just generally, do you think that the current Open Streets program effectively addresses concerns around equity? And would you say that as we move towards a more equitable program, um, I, you know, I still have my legislation in the council. It can be amended to address a number of concerns. And based on what I heard today, is your concern in making the Open Streets program permanent, which I wholeheartedly support, a resource issue? Yeah, and, and council member, I want to apologize. I know you, you wrote me a letter raising some of these issues, and I'm sorry, I have a response drafted and we didn't get it out the door in time. You you will get it shortly. Um, and I think I want to just um, you raised some very good questions, and, and I, I think I want to talk about it a little bit. And I, I have to say, I think you know, again, as with all these programs, we learned a lot as we went along. Um, with open streets, you know, when the mayor announced it, we tried very much to make it an open process. We did have an online portal. I had my borough commissioners contact each of your offices, contact all the community boards, contact local civic associations. We tried to do as much outreach as we could. We tried to make sure we were doing it in multiple languages. Um, and I will say, quite honestly, you know, there was support for the program all over the city, but it was not the same all over the city. Um, I think some council members, I'll just say perhaps in more affluent uh, kind of transit rich districts came to me with a list of, you know, 40 streets they wanted to make open streets. Some council members told us they didn't want any. So, you know, it was not sort of necessarily the same appetite for it in every part of the city. But that said, you know, we, we certainly tried, for example, we created the list of all the COVID neighborhoods and sort of made an extra effort to reach out again to council members, to community boards, to some case, you know, NYCHA associations. And I will say, I'll, I'll send you the list in my response. I think we got a little bit of an unfair rap. In the end, we did hit many, many neighborhoods throughout the city, including almost all the, the COVID neighborhoods. That said, the challenge we have, and you raised it, it is a resource issue. In those more well-resourced neighborhoods, um, you know, again, in a model where we're not trying to rely on NYPD or heavy city, you know, city worker staffing, it really helps when you have community partners. And that I understand. Yeah, I understand that. I, I just don't have a lot of time, Commissioner. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I, I know it's communication, it's coordination, it's language. And I also realize that open streets doesn't work in every single neighborhood. I think I said that in my opening testimony when we first heard my legislation many, many months ago. And so I know that in my district, for example, they really set the model for bringing communities together to kind of manage those open streets and pretty much take those tasks away from the NYPD. Mm -hmm. And it was replicated in North Brooklyn. And considering that there is a resource issue, um, you know, it, it's kind of hard to replicate that in other neighborhoods where I think it can be beneficial to the open streets program. So hopefully we can get to a place where DOT can work with those community groups to provide them a little bit more than, than, than what is happening right now. So do you think that the open, there's another program that I wanted to, to bring up. Um, do you think the city should pursue an essential places program similar to Oakland, California? where their Department of Transportation works with communities to provide temporary street improvements in areas with already very, very frequent community activity. Yeah, I, I sort of feel like we're doing that. Perhaps we do it a little more piecemeal, but I think between open streets, open restaurants, our plaza program, now we're doing outdoor learning. Um, you know, I think we are kind of opening our streets up for a whole bunch of community purposes. And again, very much driven on a, you know, open application process, um, looking for a lot of community partnership. And we're happy to help with that. Um, I wanted to, uh, again, I think that, yeah, with all these programs and then open street schools, it can be very, very successful, but just identifying these kinds of places, I think it helps with the equity issue. So I just want to commend the new temporary lanes you added to the Upper East Side on 60th and 61st Streets. 
where you're including delineators, marking adjustments and signs. And I hope that that kind of treatment is gonna be added to other temporary bike lanes. And as we work to expand the program, hopefully make more connections to larger bike networks. So- um, I'm expired. I just wanted to, I hope to uh, receive the response to my letter very soon. Um, I don't know what date you gave me, but I'm expecting it's going out the mail any minute. And I'm um, looking forward to hopefully implementing some version of the Office of Active Transportation, since you did mention micromobility a lot. And we want to prevent any future tragedies on our streetscape. I'm looking forward to working with you on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Next, we will hear from oh. Councilmember Rose. Councilmember Rose. Time begins. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner, um, I'm sorry if I'm being repetitive. It's good to see you. I had a little technical difficulty today um, getting in. Um, so maybe I'm sure I'm a man, uh, uh, covered a lot of the um, private street uh, questions that I had. But I just wanted to know when a developer um, requests uh, permits to do private streets, are, are there a specific standard that they have to, and does it have to, um, you know, comply with the same standard that um, our streets, public streets have to do? And is there any um, maintenance enforcement for these private streets, um, you know, we have private streets where the craters are so deep that um, um, get access to um, to pick the young emergency services. So um, uh, they become um, almost um, inaccessible. Even the people who live on those streets, parking on on neighboring streets because they can't their own. Um, and then I just tell you, I know you know it has been a little special on Staten Island. And um, we have really um, uh, we had hope um, we could. And um, there's a, a problem. The streets that have been designated open, there's no there is, um, there's no barricades. There's nothing um, there that it is an open street. Um, and so um, it, it's, it's baffling. Um, and one of our open streets are in, is in a desolate area. Um, and there's a lot of dumping and, and the street itself is in, in um, bad repair. So I was just wondering, you know, um, uh, with the coordination, the police department doesn't even acknowledge um, a couple of that have open streets. Um, there's nothing there to even indicate that it is. So um, I, I know that's a lot, and I know your special project <laughs> with our issues, but um, I, I thought I was hoping that you could uh, give me some some answers to those. I, I will, I'll, I'll take them in reverse order, council member, and I apologize, your bandwidth is a little low, so I'm not sure I quite heard everything you said, but I'll, I'll, I'll answer best oh, I'm I can. Sorry. I, I'm sorry to hear that there's okay. a problem with the open streets. I'll, I'll get for you, I, maybe I'll have my staff call you afterwards, uh, and let's go to the location. I mean, obviously, if we need to work on the barricades and coordinating with PD, uh, l let's make sure we do that. I, I know it was, it was hard fought to get those streets in Staten Island, and, and we want to make sure they're successful. Yeah. I think on the larger question of the private streets, your, your questions get at the heart of the issue. They are not required to be built to the same standard as city streets with the same levels of quality construction and drainage. That's why developers like them, because they get to do them very cheaply. Uh, and in the end, you're right, it's the local residents and the city that sort of wind up paying the bill some years down the road. I'm certainly hearing today that this has become a growing issue. And I, I think after this hearing, um, we, we kind of need to convene some of you all 
and, and talk through potential solutions. We obviously don't want there to be streets with craters that are dangerous and impassable. And, you know, we're hearing yeah. from you all. We got I mean, like, um, solutions. right. I mean, like sanitation, when there's an um, unhealthy or um, unsafe situation, um, they have a process that they go through and they will eventually and, and, and clean it up and take care of the problem. Is there any, is there any sort of that um, DOT has that, in, that in, indicative of, you know, like we need to now intervene. We need to go in and and and, and then maybe work through uh, the cost fighting with, you know, the developer or owners association. I'm expired. Is there some point that you know that that th there's some metric or some point where you know dot just we need to we have to it's a matter of public safety the fire department couldn't even yeah. get down the street to you know to do whatever needs to be done yeah we we it's a good question council member rose and and we do go in and obviously we'll we'll, we'll, we'll take any request that you all get for where we see particularly dangerous conditions, I think, and, and we will do emergency roads. One of the challenge we have is some of the roads are so substandard, they've been flooded so many times that when we go in to patch them, it's just sort of sticking a Band-Aid on top of a Band-Aid. But, um, you know, it sounds like we need to kind of refocus on some of these very worst streets, maybe some short-term solutions and then some longer-term solutions. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Council Member Deutsch. Council Member Deutsch. Time begins. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, so I just want to get some clarity on the outdoor seating for restaurants, um, which I'm a little unclear about. So I'll give an example. I have a, a restaurant in my district. I'm going to use this restaurant as, um, as an example. Um, so when the guidelines originally came out for outdoor seating, they were very vague and they weren't really, um, um, they didn't come out with the guidelines like, like right away. It took some time. And like there's this restaurant that put out that, the barriers that DOT uses and they fill it up, you know, you fill it up with water. And DOT came in uh, several weeks later saying that those barriers are no good that it doesn't meet the specs. My question for that is, is that if DOT uses those same barriers for construction sites in front of construction sites for walkways, um, why is it good for that and not good for a restaurant to keep the customer safe? That's number one. Number two is that the in, DOT inspector came down saying that they need a handicap ramp for a wheelchair going from the curb to the street. So according to the ADA compliance, um, if you have 5% dedicated seating for people with disabilities, then that's all you need. So why a restaurant that has, let's say, 60% seating on the sidewalk and 40% on the streets, why would they need that ramp? That's number two. And number three, uh, in order to properly social distance and to make sure businesses succeed, sometimes they need to extend above their property line. So this specific restaurant got permission from the neighbor and has an, an additional five feet that goes beyond their property line. And they received a 24 hour notice to remove two tables. So um, I'll start take those questions in order. And I think on the one you're mentioning about the what's called the Yodox, the barriers with water, I think, as I said early on, and again, I apologize for this, we had a bunch of different agencies who kind of quickly jumped in to try and inspect all the restaurants and, you know, there was not perfect consistency. We do allow those barriers if they're filled with water. So if this restaurant is, is still having an issue with that, um, please let me know. In some cases, we saw that the barriers were empty. So I don't know the particular circumstances of this restaurant. All right, so, the, so what happened was the restaurant removed the barriers and it cost them $2,500 just last week. They uh, bought um, they bought new uh, barriers and it was an extra cost of $2,500. And they were, they were um, asked to remove them. 
So I'd like to get the particulars of that. Um, who asked them to remove them? What the uh, DOT. Were? DOT. Um, well, so maybe you could get us some of that paperwork and connect us with the restaurant. Okay, excellent. Okay, because okay. according to the specs, as they go up, they're supposed to be a little wider, and those barrier and the, those barriers that DOT uses is a little narrow on top, so it didn't meet exactly the specs that you have in your guidelines. So they were asked to replace them. All right, well, let us take a look. And I would just say to you and, and sort of any other members, if you're hearing from restaurants who have concerns, obviously our borough commissioner's offices were, were there. I to reached out. Trouble, were there no, to I reached out. Um, I reached out to the borough commissioner and I was told whatever the guideline says, that's what you have to do. Okay, well, I will. Okay. I'll, we'll so that's number one. The second, uh, the second one. Okay, is so the, if you the wheelchair ramp. Um, yeah, correct. I think we just thought it was it was sort of too complicated to parse it out like that. I think most restaurants, it's been pretty easy. They've just they've either taken a little metal ramp or they built a little something out of wood. Hopefully, nobody has found that requirement too complicated. I actually haven't heard any complaints about it. It uh, actually it takes away seating when you have to put a ramp. It takes away one table, so that's why this restaurant had to uh, exceed well, most two feet. Since they're supposed to keep their table six feet apart, they put the ramp right in the middle. Well, it depends the layout. Okay, so so that is okay. That's not a big deal. And then the third part, the third question was the permission uh, from the neighbor. So, yeah. so that is not actually yet an official part of the program. Right now, restaurants are only legally entitled under the Open Restaurants Program to have the space right in front of their storefront, on the sidewalk and on the street. I recognize that that restaurants have started to spread out, and it's certainly something. City Hall is looking at and, and seeing how you know we can sort of accommodate, but technically right now that that's not part of the program. Yeah, but and that's an issue. Uh, that's an that, issue for the small businesses. All right, no, I understand. Because in order to properly social the, distance, you know, we're 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 talking about how to potentially um, codify that part of the program, but it does it does sort of add to the challenges of sort of getting permission from the establishments next door, making sure. No one feels pressured to, to, you know, perhaps pay for the privilege. So we're sort of looking at those details. And look, as I said, one of the challenges we have with this program, it's not necessarily, unfortunately, going to work for every single one of the 27,000 restaurants in New York City. We're trying uh, to make it work for as many of them as we possibly can. Okay, so I'll reach out to you. I have, I have one more. I have one more issue. Um, the city is doing handicapped ramps, which. Um, uh, we know that uh, the city is in a nine billion, more than nine billion dollar deficit, and they're redoing handicap handicap ramps uh, at the corners. Um, so you would see um, ramps that are really not, you know, in disarray or damaged, and the city is going around and redoing them. So why is that considered essential right now, and why is the city spending money on that? And number two is that when I have uh, ponding conditions that the city has deemed that they need to fix it. It's been water sitting there for ma for many, many weeks. And when I reached out to DOT, they told me that's not essential. And it, literally you have like pools of water. And I have like three locations that have been really bad for the last four years. And I'm still waiting for it to get done. But they were supposed to be done already, but the city is saying that's not essential. But redoing handicapped ramps when we're at a deficit, that's essential. So, council member, you probably remember that the city was sued by a coalition of disability groups over the lack of ped ramp access. Um, the lawsuit was enjoined by the Department of Justice and the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District. Um, and you know, clearly, there was a sense, um, you know, amongst the the sort of the top officials of the DOJ that the city was not doing a sufficient job in complying with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and so the city settled that case. And as part of that settlement, committed to admittedly a massive, massive program to make every ped ramp in New York City fully compliant with the ADA. Um, and I understand probably- Do you, have, yeah, do you have the cost of that? Uh, I do, it's multiple billions of dollars. Uh, it's an enormously expensive um, undertaking again, mandated to us by the Department of Justice. Uh, and I have a feeling if, if I talk to all your colleagues uh, on this uh, on this panel, some would think um, it's absolutely essential. Some may question it, but we are nonetheless under a, a consent decree with, with DOJ. Um, 
you know, that said, I don't, you know, I think it's, it's will probably be a discussion with the court at some point about how the city continues, you know, full compliance with that given all the fiscal challenges, but we are currently under a, a very ironclad uh, legal mandate to continue making very robust investments in the PEDRAM program. That, that is required under the law, the Americans with Disabilities Act. I appreciate, I appreciate the answer. I appreciate that. Um, can we make uh, ponding conditions essential? <laughs> the fact that well, we have, have mosquitoes and I don't know if you can get the full weight conditions. of the U.S. Department of Justice behind that, but I'm happy to talk to you also about places where you're seeing ponding. Yeah, and they're both, they're both at walkways, so it brings the same issue. And, uh, and also with all the mosquitoes and uh, West, West, uh, West Nile virus. And I think it's uh, important to, to get these rectified. So I'll reach out to your office and give you those locations. Thank you, Councilmember. Gracias, thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Councilmember Levin, followed by Councilmember Yeager. Councilmember Levin. Thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, uh, I, I, I want to uh, concur with all of my colleagues at how successful the, um, the restaurants have been. Um, I think that it's been a, a real lifeline to small businesses um, that they're able to set up, um, you know, a, a few uh, a few seats out there. And with the weather being as nice as it's been, um, that's been very, um, you know, it's been it's 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 kept a lot of them in business. Um, especially with the kind of mixed messages that the city and state are sending around indoor dining. Um, uh, I do, I am concerned about what happens when the weather uh, gets colder um, and what is, what is DOT, um, what are the conversations between DOT and DOB around um, uh, having uh, gas heating uh, in these spaces when the weather gets cold? Um, and I think some of you have probably heard the mayor has, has been asked about this and, and talked a bit about it in some of his morning press briefings. Um, you know, City Hall is certainly leading a, an interagency effort and involves us and Department of Buildings and FDNY um, mm -hmm. to look at how we could continue this program further into the winter you know, how we would potentially do heating and, and make sure that it's safe. And, and I think we're going to have more to, to say on that soon, but there is a, an interagency group uh, looking at that for sure. And, and we, we recognize, um, you know, a lot of these businesses would like to keep operating, you know, even as the weather turns cold. Yeah. We, and, and we it, want to make sure we can do it, it safely. Though. Hence DOB and FDNY right, uh, being right. involved in the discussions. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I would um, uh, urge, the city to move to move as quickly as possible and to communicate as as much as possible with the restaurants because you know they have to figure out whether to stay in business or not or whether to you know uh fold so it's it's you know they have to be able to plan so um, i would just urge uh, uh, quick action on that um i i was encouraged that you said that um you said i think around 160 schools, um, streets around schools have been closed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is this is a potential solution um, for COVID transmission that um, uh, really uh, we shouldn't. Um, it's hard to it's hard to uh, oversell how important this is uh, in terms of limiting COVID infection for um, in-person learning. Um, it is, it's, you know, I think the science is pretty clear that um, fresh air um, really prevents um, infection. And, um, you know, I, I well, 160 is a, is a uh, promising number. I, I would hope that that would be a, a much higher number um, because I know that there's, you know, every, every, most school buildings have at least one of their frontages that are um, on a less traveled street that probably could, um, you know, with the proper signage and um, coordination configuration, be closed off and not really have a major impact on, on vehicular traffic patterns. Um, and so I'm, I would hope that that number would be, you know, five or six or seven times more than that. Is there, is there a, um, are you working with the DOE to uh, increase that number? 
Well, I think as, as you heard in my testimony, I mean, DOE did a wild, wide open process. They invited every principal in the school, not just city public schools, but charter schools and private schools to apply for outdoor learning space. Um, and you know what, what DOE did ask them to do, because remember, the management of this sort of is going to fall on school officials was to first look at what their own facilities were. And look, throughout New York City, you know there's a huge variation. Some schools have big, beautiful fields. Some schools are right on the middle of an urban street uh, without a lot of outdoor space. Mm. So DOE you know, particularly focused first on schools that had no outdoor space. Um, you know, look first to park areas, which are obviously in some ways the safest and easiest for kids. And then looked at, at um, you know, public streets after that with a particular prioritization appropriately so of COVID impacted neighborhoods. So, you know, but any school could apply, over 800 applied. Um, and this is how the space has been allocated. The application process is still open. Mm -hmm. Any school's principals can come to DOE and apply for that public space. But, you know, I think just to remember, particularly, for example, for classroom learning, there's some logistics Time is expired. Um, in doing it on a roadway, uh, you know, which potentially can be a bit easier, you know, in a park where you don't have to deal with barricades, moving vehicles, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Councilmember Yeager. Councilmember Yeager. Time begins now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, I just, it's a very brief follow up on Councilman Deutsch's question because I've seen the same thing on those pedestrian ramps. And I, I know that uh, the city's doing this as a result of of the, the settlement or the consent decree, um, your, your reference to that sometime in the future may be an opportunity to go and revisit that. Uh, has there been any conversation about going to the court and, and, uh, and reopening the case and showing what the progress that's been made and asking for, say, a two year delay? Before you answer, I, just, I wanna give you the context. Um, in, in my neighborhood, which borders Chaim's, uh, Councilman Deutsch's, uh, what I'm seeing is very uh, 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 pedestrian ramps that are in very good condition, but may not meet the best specs because they don't have the, the bumpy uh, red part portion, but they do have the lined uh, cement portion. So it's there. And a lot of this is in residential neighborhoods where there isn't really a lot of foot traffic, but because you have this consent decree that you're required to do it, you're kind of forced to do every single one, no matter what, um, whether it's necessary or not. Uh, and so my question really is whether or not you can, you're, you're in a position where you can go back and say, this is what we've done. This is what we're facing. This is the cost of the program. And we will commit that, you know, in an, in an out of year capital program, we're going to get back to this, but we need a break. So, and, and I appreciate the question. Um, and at this point, you know, again, as, as part of the consent decree and, and the way DOJ is looking at this and I hear you can have your opinion on it. I may have mine as well. Um, the PED ramp must meet every single detail of the specs put out by DOJ and USDOT, and they are very exacting. The tolerances, right. the planes, the, the truncated domes, the color contrasts. Um, and, and so, you know, it is an exacting standard to meet. Um, I, and I may. the way, yeah. My question is shorter than yours. Um, I don't dispute anything you're saying. I know that that you, I don't want to use the term gun to your head, but you do. They they have the standard. You have to comply with what they've said. You have to meet them, whether I like the pedestrian ramp or not, whether it's necessary or not, whether you think it's necessary or not is really irrelevant because you're stuck with this order that the city did because it had to, it had to enter into the agreement. My suggestion though, I'm not the expert, you are. Uh, but my suggestion would be whether or not you and the Corporation Council can have a conversation in the next day or two about what steps need to take place to, to, go, to go back to DOJ and say, can we reopen this? Let's have those conversations. Perhaps there are members of the council who would support this and give you a letter of support and say, this is what we're, we're doing in the city right now. This is the problem. These are the problems we have. And at least start the conversation because this is a multi-million dollar a multi hundreds of millions of dollar expenditure every two Bill, billions and, and council member i've already had many conversations with the corporation council about this starting back in march because uh, you may remember at first we suspended a lot of our operations during the height of the pandemic and obviously 
we are very sensitive to the budget condition and now the very dire competing um, priorities. So let me just reassure you, yes, we have been in communication with Corp Council. Uh, you know, our lawyers are formulating a legal strategy uh, I, and, and, you know, m might some support from council members be helpful? I, I may take you up on that offer, so, so thank you. My next very quick uh, uh, question relates to the second piece of, of Councilman Deutsch's question regarding the, not gonna get into the particular restaurant because I happen to know that restaurant and its problems as well, um, but the general topic of restaurants in some of our neighborhoods where uh, they, uh, they are in residential areas or abut residential areas and it's relatively simple. This is not Midtown Manhattan. This is actually one of the conversations I had when the city was doing this program at the beginning. The mayor announced it before we did a bill so the mayor was actually there ahead of us on this. And uh, the one piece I think that, that you, you and Councilman Deutsch alluded to is dealing with the neighbor permission thing. Um, I, I believe notwithstanding whatever statute we gave the mayor on this topic, the, the department can institute some sort of a program where if there's a letter of no objection from a neighbor, um, you know, if there's a shoe store or a home or something else, an apartment building next door to a restaurant, or an unoccupied business because the business is unoccupied. I mean, I have restaurants that are literally next door to, to stores that are available for lease. Um, whether there can be some kind of letter of no objection process where the, the neighboring, you know, but not in an official crazy way, but the same way that you're doing it now with, with uh, this streamlined uh, immediate okay approval process. We are council members uh, certainly. We are certainly trying to figure that out. Just, just one challenge I will flag is Part of how we made this program work is we were able to get an agreement with the state liquor authority. And I think one thing about sort of codifying, allowing restaurants to further expand is the state liquor authority was comfortable with the space that was sort of adjacent and right in front of an establishment. It, it, it's a maybe a more involved negotiation to, to try and expand that. But we hear you. We know a lot of restaurants want to do it. Frankly, some have already gone off and, and done it. Um, and, and we are trying to, to figure it out as, as, as quickly as we can. Permission uh, to go on with one more question. Can I make a suggestion on that topic is that if you can, if you can sort of parse the issues maybe and leave those restaurants that have liquor licenses aside and let's say, you know, pizza shops, burger places, places that are not serving alcohol, maybe there can be a separate kind of, uh, you know, okay there, and then the SLA would be fine with it. I just, good I mean, good, I good suggestion. I just, I want to, we're running out of, you know, I've, I've made this, uh, this, this speech in various uh, different ways, but we're running out of time on the lifeline of restaurants. I know you know that because I know you've, you've seen this and that's why you, you've been uh, pushing this for a long time. But uh, until we're at the point where we're going to reopen them to some capacity, we're, we're letting them rely on this tiny little sliver that they have and they're dying every day. They're just, they're shutting down. So if we can give them an extra five, six, seven tables and give them the, the will to, you know, soldier on for another month or two or three and hopefully get them back open, maybe that's the solution to, to not killing all of them. That's all for me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, I, I just have a few questions before you will go and we will continue listening from the other panels. Uh, one is, as you know, when we do car free day, unfortunately, you know what happened this year, we couldn't do it. it, it but when we, or we mean you, DOT, or working with local entity or typical case, a car free day, before closing the street, you know, you need to check with the NYPD because it's all, there's also matter related to safety. And does NYPD check with you? I mean, DOT, when they close particular blocks? And what is the procedure that they follow up to reopen? So, and, and look, I want to I wanna be careful. Obviously, this summer, we've had some extraordinary circumstances. And, and I know, um, obviously, I got the letter, uh, you know, that was addressed to Commissioner Shea from, from Borough President Brewer talking particularly about the issue of some streets in Manhattan closed down around precincts. And, and I will certainly say, I think, you know, we try and work closely with NYPD and communicate and coordinate about street closures. It is not a seamless system. I, I will readily concede that. And I, I um, 
you know, recently talked to, to you know, um, uh, Deputy uh, Fal uh, Chief uh, Fausto Pichardo, particularly about this issue of the streets closed around precincts. And I know Commissioner Shea addressed it yesterday. And I think PD is committing um, to try and get as many of those streets open as quickly as they can. And we are going to try and do a better job of coordinating. But I think sometimes NYPD for operational reasons, and obviously this summer protests, there were a bunch of things going on. Um, you know, they did sometimes close streets. I'm, I'm not going to say we always we always were knew about it in, in real time, but we've we've pledged to try and have better communication. And I think, you know, he and I talked about, you know, for DOT, our goal, obviously, we want all the streets or as many of the streets as possible open for pedestrians, for bikes, you know, for the movement of New Yorkers. And, and just, you know, we're going to work with them to find that balance in, in places where they think there's a there's a public uh, a public safety issue. Yeah. I, I just hope that, again, that we get to reopen those streets as, po as soon as possible. Yeah. And as you know, like, and I can say the vast majority of New Yorkers support the peaceful protesters. Only the crazy guy in this is the one who wants to use, you know, those images to move his own agenda. Unfortunately, he will not be able, you know, to win under his that platform. It, it, but we definitely need to add to see how we can reopen those streets. And, and no, as I agree with you, they have been challenging time. And, and I, as, as everyone know, we support all the good police officers that they're, doing, that they're doing the job. But also we know that there's bad apple everywhere, not only the NYPD, but also in government, private, public, all sectors. So I, I think that, you know, as a city that has always welcomed peaceful demonstration, and, and I hope again that we can be able to, you know, be in a better place when it comes to better relationship. But I think that those streets that have been closed, they should be reopened as soon as possible. We, and, we, we agree with you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. And, and, and my other question is about, you know, the cyclists. Uh, as you know, we saw the tragic death of assistant district attorney, uh, Sarah Pitt, after, you know, she was uh, struck. Uh, by a bus. Again, by no mean, I mean in that all bus drivers or all buses, like they are bad, you know, individual or entity, but this is about, you know, improving safety. And and we stand together on there, you know, when, uh, with you leading the press conference in the Bronx, so about, also about a, a speed camera and other initiatives that you're working. So beside what you already have done in so far, what is the future or improving safety for cyclists that you see that we need to do is still in our city. Yeah, and, and look, I honestly want to, want to say about Sarah Pitts, a, a terrible tragedy. And, and look, I'm going to say we're, we're grieving about um, this past Labor Day weekend. It was not a good weekend on our roadways. Um, there were a lot of crashes, sadly, a lot of fatalities, uh, several involving motorcycles, a couple involving cyclists. Um, it seemed it was just a very bad combination. Nice weather, a lot of people out, you know, too much joy riding in my opinion. You know, I've, I've talked about some of the things we've tried to do this summer, even as at times our agency was was really trying to shut down. We've continued to expand the, the speed camera program. We hit the, you know, the state target of 750 schools. We now have over a thousand speed cameras around the city. And, you know, I think some of you know, we've reported the data. We've seen tremendous speeding this summer. It's been kind of one of the tragic side effects of COVID-19. And by the way, it's not just New York. Cities all around the country are experiencing the same phenomenon. Uh, people kind of went into the lockdown and as they've taken back to the streets, there's just been unfortunately, I think a lot of reckless driving in the case of motorcycles, some, some reckless riding. So we're gonna continue to build on that speed camera program. We recently announced reducing you, were, you joined us reducing, uh, up in the Bronx, reducing speed limits on nine more arterials. And, you know, the city is starting to talk about, you know, as we continue to build out bike network and Vision Zero projects, what potentially our, our, um, our next set of legislative initiatives might be on Vision Zero. I'm not going to talk about those today because I think we want to consult with you all. But, you know, we're going to be, as the mayor has always said, looking at, at always what is the next level for Vision Zero. And obviously, unfortunately, um, this past weekend has reminded us again, there, there's so much more we still need to do. And we certainly grieve over uh, Sarah Pitts and, and the other lives lost. 
and and what about commissioner with with when it comes to the open street uh, in the surrounding school area uh, what role is dot playing uh, uh, coordinating with doe and other in agency and city hall and and what should we visualize will happen when the school is open uh, in the city and how they will be using those additional resources. And I asked a question because it, I remember when my daughter, she was in kindergarten, the West Side Montessori School, you know, they were using the street. They took the kid to the Hippo Park and, you know, they use whatever resources are around the neighborhood. And I think that when we talk about the use of up streets in front of the surrounding school area, I think New York can think about that there's going to be chair and tables in those, in those locations. And for me, what I visualize is that teacher and principal, they will be able to use those resources to walk with the student outside, to do math, counting how many cars, pattern, you know, like visiting the local small business. Here in places like in Northern Manhattan, we, have, we are the second largest green area. 550 acres of land, the second one after Central Park, when you look at Highbridge, Inwood, and Fort Triumph Park together. So I think that I definitely would like to see the day when teachers spend more time with the student outside the classroom. But I think that so far, when parents think about how the city will be using the open street close to the school, I think they visualize a chair and, and table will be outside there. What is the planning that is going on when it comes to the use of open street in front of the school? And what should parents expect will happen there? And uh, it, it's a good question, Mr. Chairman. I think it's a little bit of um, all of the above. But again, as I said in my testimony, I, I think you know when the mayor and chancellor announced the program and we decided to very much make it driven by local schools at the principal's discretion, the principal working with their own teachers, their, their PTA, their parents, their local community. And you know, we created, I think, a very wide open application process, interagency, you know, mainly involving Department of Education, Parks Department, DOT, and then of course also, you know, NYPD and FDNY to make sure everything we were doing is safe. And I think we've gotten a, a variety of approaches, some of them very creative. Um, so far over 800 schools, I think as I mentioned, over 800 schools have applied, a bunch are using park spaces, around 160 are using streets, although I think we, we certainly will expect that number to grow. And I, you know, I think like so many things that have happened during this pandemic, um, you know, I think the teachers and the principals are, are going to get more and more creative as the program unfolds. I think we've had a very good partnership with DOE, really gotten to work closely with um, uh, Deputy Chancellor Goldmark and the, you know, the Office of People Transportation and, and my Office of, of Student Safety run by Nina Heyman. So a good working partnership, interagency collaboration, which again, I think has been the key for a lot of the successful things we've done this summer. And you know, I think we'll take from you all as this program unfolds, as the school year gets underway, I think there's going to be some trial and error, but l let's learn from what works and we will do our part to try and encourage and disseminate the best practices everywhere we can. Okay, will, will those miles of a street being closed in front of a school, will be also county as part of the 33 miles short that we are to complete the 100 miles? Um, I, that's a good question. I, I don't know whether we're going to count them. We probably should. Thank you. Okay. And, 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 and again, like, you know, I, I, I just hope that we can, my question is going to be, you know, what is our plan to, uh, to get the other additional 33 miles that we are short to? And, and, and I get what you say that there's a different, you know, way of how people feel about, you know, uh, dedicating a street to pedestrian and cyclists and to use by local restaurants. But I, I just hope that we can continue planning to get that goal or get into the 100 miles. And as you know, we still have some a proposal that we're waiting for in Northern Manhattan. I know that, as you say, that there's other that uh, you have opposition. I hope that we can follow with you and your team to see where there's potential 
to go and close those 33 additional miles to accomplish our goal. But we, we certainly welcome the council's partnership on that. Okay. And my last question is about Muppets. And as you know, we cannot leave this hearing about the use of street. And as everyone know, we I appreciate the expansion of city bike and, 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 and electrical bike and Muppets. And I've been a big supporter. However, as you know, as I supported all the new innovation transportation, the safety of pedestrian and especially senior citizen for me is important. So it, it, as I have shared with you, there's a bill that I already have introduced. I hope to work with you and your team to look at this bill. And the bill, as, as you know, for the purpose of everyone in this audience and the whole New Yorkers is intended to do is to put more clarity of what should be required, not only by from rebel, but to any mob, a, a private entity that would like to do business in our street. So how things going with, with rebel after they are back in business and, and, and how do you feel? Have you had the time to look at the bill? Uh, will you be open to continue conversation to see how we also move that legislation? Right, so um, thank you for the question. Rebel's been back on the streets for about two weeks. And so far, honestly, I'd, I'd say the report's a little mixed. Um, I think we're still seeing, you know, cases, uh, particularly I'm getting sent pictures of people not wearing helmets. I'm actually hoping, as I said earlier today, to be visiting with the Rebel leadership on Friday. Um, you know, we are also, as I said, we are, you know, getting the rulemaking process underway, which I know, Mr. Chairman, is something your bill addresses. And of course, always happy to work with you on that. Um, you know, we do want to make sure we can make that operation uh, as safe as we can. But I will still say, and I know I've heard from some of you, uh, you know, here today, some of you big concerns about safety of Revel, but I've, I've heard from many on the council saying, we love Revel, you have to reopen them. We think they're an important piece of, of mobility particularly at a time when we're trying to discourage auto usage. So we're trying to balance all those competing interests and, and part of the rulemaking process and, and maybe it would be something in your legislation as well as making sure that we get public input, that we hear from all the voices and we craft a set of regulations which are really gonna work uh, if we're gonna have these mopeds on city streets. Yeah, and definitely, you know, we, from the beginning, we appreciate what they did it when they provide free services uh, during the coronavirus, especially to essential workers in uptown. Uh, however, there's always a, a, a lot of concern and, and, and I'm pretty sure that as I'm talking right now, the constituency of Northern Manhattan, where they expand the big time, they also will share a lot of concern beside what I can say, which are related to safety. So what I hope again is that we can address. I think that, you know, the, uh, Electrical buy, mopeds are important. However, as someone that have a, a, a license to drive a car, I cannot drive a motor a motorcycle unless I get a particular license for the motorcycle. And someone who get in the moped is a similar to use as a motorcycle. So I think that, you know, being sure that a safety measure are taking care should be something that I'm pretty sure that a, a rebel or whoever else would like to bring Muppet to the city they need to address. So yeah. I, I just hope that we can, again, talk about the bill and see how we can, as we have done before, you know, be able to look at a at, at, at potential to bring legislation, not only to Rebel, but all the Muppet uh, 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 services. Look, look, look forward to that discussion. Okay. With the city bike, and which is my last question. Uh, by the way, we have a, a Inwood tour on the 20th. Uh, with city bike that I also would like to follow with your team. Uh, uh, if that they work for you, great. And I know that you have done it, we have done it before in Brooklyn, in the Bronx. And, uh, but I would like to follow to see, it, and I'm sorry, it's on the 19th, but if that day doesn't worry, more than happy to follow with your team to okay. see how we can, you know, tour together. We see city bike up to Amsterdam in 179. It, it, I hope to see them coming very soon to Inwood. It, because as everyone said that, you know, the expansion of city bike is so critical, especially in this advantaged community that they had transportation desert. So it's more, more than a question is like hoping that we continue working 
with you and city bike to expand their services here and, and, and I, I know i'm sorry we talked about that ride earlier this summer i definitely want to get it scheduled great thank you i see that councilmember cohen has another question so councilmember cohen if you got a question we give you your turn for you to ask and then uh, we will move to the next panel I'll be very, very brief, Chair. I appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner, it's just a follow-up to the Chair's question about uh, the street closings around the precincts. Uh, do you know what the jurisdictional basis is for that? Who has the jurisdiction to close those streets? I mean, you know, I, I know there's this sort of this discussion that technically, you know, NYPD is supposed to apply to DOT. I don't, I don't know operationally that that's sort of particularly what happens. Obviously, I think when PD thinks they have sort of a security situation on their hands, they act quickly. But as I said, I have been in communication with, you know, NYPD Chief of Operations, uh, Chief Fausto Pichardo, you know, knowing the concern we've been hearing about the closures around the precincts and, you know, he and I are gonna work together, you know, please come to either of us with particular concerns. You know, we've agreed, we, we share the desire to try and wherever possible minimize street closures. But, you know, I think if PD sees a safety and security issue, you know, I'm, I'm not really going to be able to tell them, you know, stop and get permission from DOT. They're, they're sort of going to take action if they think they need to. That said, they shouldn't leave the streets closed for, for weeks on end. I think everyone agrees with that. Yeah, I mean, they could come to you the day after and say yesterday we needed to close the street for an emergency situation. But I, I think that the process should be formalized. Um, I think it's important that DOT retain ultimate jurisdiction over the accessibility of our streets. I mean, I can't. I can't okay. Well, I, I think uh, happy to have more discussion about that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. There are no further questions for Commissioner Trottenberg. Are there any further questions from council members? Seeing none, uh, I will now call on Marjorie Perlmutter, the chair of the board and, of standards and appeals. Elio, and if you don't mind, uh, before the commissioner leave, I also I just would like to, you know, end the highlighting how this area looked like. And thank, uh, I guess I said, Rebecca, it, it, everyone that work with it, with this particular area, this air site is the, I think that the first one that they also they apply with a new a regulation that the city established to uh, have a use of the street with social distance, but also to serve those individuals that would like to enjoy a nice dinner here in Dykeman between Seaman and Broder. So thank you, Commissioner. It, it looks beautiful, and, and after we're gonna be dress, and they're going to be applying for have dinner, and they're going to be applying for for a permanent plaza too. Okay, I, I don't, understood. Look I don't want a that. moment to go by without just giving a shout out to Sean Quinn and Stephanie Levinsky who are on this Zoom too. They did a tremendous amount of work yes. and their teams for Dykeman. So, um, thank Thanks, you, Rebecca. thank you. Excellent point. Yes, it, it, it took a, a lot of fantastic work from DOT, but obviously we're very pleased with the result. And the NYPD also, they deserve to be thanks because also, as we say, I know everyone know, I been, I will always be involved in civil disobedience. I will always be marching in peaceful protests, but I always say that everything is local. And we also have a prison here in Northern Manhattan that they also been very helpful working with the local small business here to be sure that the, any issue of safety is addressed together. So thank you. So, Thank you. Um, if no further questions for the commissioner, we'll now call on Marjorie Perlmutter, the chair of the Board of Standards and Appeals. Um, chair Perlmutter, I will read the affirmation and then ask you to confirm your response aloud for the record. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. You may begin when ready. Good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Rodriguez and members of the Committee on Transportation and other others listening in. Uh, I just want to throw in that I'm a great fan of the open restaurants and open streets program. And I want to take this chance to just thank the council members who participated in, in it. And of course, Commissioner Trottenberg for the excellent work on the program. Um, I am, as was stated, the chair of the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals, and I present the following um, BSA testimony in support of introduction, in, intro, 
2051-2020 and 2052-2020 concerning the regulation of private streets in Staten Island. Um, the testimony that follows is actually an excerpt and a direct quote from a BSA resolution on a case in Staten Island that was decided on February 25th, 2020. Um, it concerned an application for a waiver under New York State General City Law Section 36, which proposed a development on privately owned unmapped streets and the role of the homeowners associations in constructing and maintaining such streets and related utilities and services. So this is the quote. In recent years, the board conducted site visits to developments on unmapped streets and heard considerable testimony that these safeguards, um, safeguards from homeowners associations have proven inadequate. The office of the Staten Island Borough President submitted an extensive amount of testimony highlighting the issues concomitant with these developments as a myriad of such exist within its borough. Over the last several years, the board has learned that problems arise because builders frequently abscond after sell out of the development to new homeowners. Homeowners are not properly notified of their obligations under the homeowners association agreement or aware that their properties are subject to the BSA's restrictions. Homeowners associations have gone unfounded and unfunded. Ownership of the private roadways has gone unrecorded and chain of title has been lost. Access easements have never been granted. Parking restrictions have gone unenforced. Snow has gone unplowed. Trash has gone uncollected. Fire hydrants have gone uninspected. Damaged roadways have gone unrepaired. Sidewalks unbuilt and street lighting never installed. Emergency vehicles have been delayed by inconsistent house numbering, non-continuous and sometimes unidentified streets and double or triple parking blocking access. And homeowners and neighborhoods have been left with infrastructure in a state of disrepair and unplanned unmapped roads that do not relate to or tie into existing roadway networks, unquote. And the submitted testimony actually has the link to that. Um, that resolution available if you're interested in it. So the, the BSA believes that the proposed legislation will go a long way in preventing the above, the above described mismanagement of private roadways and permit the appropriate city agencies to regulate and enforce their proper management. Uh, the BSA is available to answer any questions you might have concerning intros 2051, 2020 and 2052, 2020. And I thank you for your time and for the opportunity to present the above testimony to the committee. And if I have another second, I just wanted to correct um, um, a little bit of um, incorrect um, responses about the DOT's role in um, with respect to the GCL 36 waivers. Um, the first is that the BSA is not a mapping agency. We are not involved in mapping at all. Uh, the second is that when there is an application for a GCL 36 waiver, we do reach out to the Department of Transportation for their advice. Uh, and we do that with many, many other kinds of applications and the DOT has been fantastically helpful with those other types of applications where they have jurisdiction. Um, their staff is incredibly professional and skilled and extremely well focused and, um, and, and we rely very much on their opinions. However, um, we are advised with respect to these unmapped streets that, D, that since DOT has no jurisdiction over them, uh, DOT will not review the unmapped portion of the application. They only review the portion where the unmapped street hits the mapped or CCO street. And that's where, because a builder's pavement plan is required by the Department of Buildings. And so that's the only piece that they'll review. Other than that, everything else goes unreviewed by DOT. Um, that's my testimony. Any questions? Are there any council members with questions for uh, Chair Perlmutter? Uh, seeing none, 
uh, we, unless Chair Rodriguez would like to uh, add anything, we will turn to public testimony. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, we'll now turn to public testimony. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our, council, our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Um, council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. And then I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. Um, first up, we will hear from Robert Englert from the Staten Island Borough President's Office, uh, followed by Amy Cohen and Stephanie Mansfield. Uh, Robert Englert. Time begins now. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. My name is Bob Englert. I am the Director of Land Use Planning and Infrastructure for Staten Island Borough President, James Otto. I will be presenting the Borough President's testimony. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of intros 2051 and 2052, but please allow me a moment to express my gratitude for the chance to come home, virtually at least. I was a proud part of this institution for more than two decades, first as a staffer, then as a council member. It was fitting then that the first time I am testifying here is in support of legislation that reflects the quintessential role of the council, the people's house, addressing a unique local issue made even more urgent by the city's agency's refusals to act. How appropriate is it that the solution to a longstanding Staten Island issue, one that eluded then council members, Mike McMahon, Andrew Lanza and me in 2003, will now be resolved by this city council in the year 2020. Today, we seek your help in formalizing the long overdue termination of one of the worst vestiges of wild, wild west era of irrational development and profiteering by developers. This legislation can be explained simply and directly in one sentence. Private streets must be mapped. It's simple as that. We do, we, do we, why do we want that? So that community members and local council members may offer their input and to ensure that city agencies will answer, will be able to answer to the people and compel to do a much more comprehensive review and in-depth analysis before construction is permitted on these private roads. For 20 years, we have sought to change this land use process. Developers aided intentionally or inadvertently by city agencies have benefited from the public's lack of understanding of the mechanics of the private road process and thus unable to coalesce into a cohesive group demanding specific changes. And so our constituents- and so our constituents, ignorant of the specific impact of private roads, have found themselves consistently frustrated and angered by the end results. Houses that are more expensive to maintain, negative quality of life issues for the community, and simply downright awful housing developments. They negatively impact existing communities and create unexpected and expensive headaches for those unsuspecting homeowners who bought into these new developments. You mean the city won't pave or plow our street? Worse still for Staten Island is that they have been allowed to continue despite our efforts because decision makers and agencies and in other off-island parts of government embrace the status quo so detrimental to our borough simply by shrugging their shoulders and saying it's what we've always done. The legislation Staten Island Borough Hall has drafted in consultation with Councilman Matteo and Council Speaker Corey Johnson's team empowers city agencies, but it also demands more and better efforts from them aimed at benefiting the public. I would like to thank Minority Leader Steve Matteo and his Chief of Staff David Carr and acknowledge the efforts of the Speaker, the Speaker's staff, including Jason Goldman, Raju Mann, Angelina Martinez Rubio, Julie Lubin, Mark Chen, John Douglas, and Michael Whitesides. Thank you. Thank you. Do any council members have a question for this panelist? Okay, seeing none. Uh, next, we will hear from uh, Stephanie Mansfield, uh, who will be followed by uh, Rachel Jones and Marco Connor Diacqua. Stephanie? Time begins now. Is Stephanie available? Okay. 
if we are having difficulty with Stephanie, we can uh, move ahead to Rachel Jones and circle back to Stephanie. Once again, time begins. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rachel. Good afternoon. Um, City Council members and Transportation Committee members. My name is Rachel Jones and I'm a member of Families for Safe Streets. We confront the epidemic of traffic violence through advocacy and support. We are not a group that wants new members, but unfortunately we keep growing. As was mentioned earlier, just two days ago, Sarah Pitts was killed while riding her bike in Brooklyn. Sarah was just like all of you, a city employee. She was an assistant district attorney in the Kings County Prosecutor's Office. District Attorney Eric Gonzalez said she was a brilliant and compassionate lawyer dedicated to seeking justice. We are overwhelmed by this sudden loss. Sarah was riding her bike when she was hit by the driver of a bus. She was rushed to Bellevue Hospital with severe head trauma, but she could not be saved. She was only 35. My spouse, Christine, was also a passionate uh, a brilliant and compassionate lawyer like Sarah. Christine worked at the Shoah Foundation, the Innocence Project, and Amnesty International during her brief career. She was on her way to get groceries near our house when she was um, struck by a reckless truck driver. She was in the crosswalk with the light. She didn't die, but she suffered severe head trauma. She was only 41 years old when this happened. 13 years later, she still grieves every day for her old pre-crash life. She still has many health complications from the crash and she isn't able to do the work that was her life's passion. Still, she's luckier than Sarah, let that sink in. New York is at an urgent moment. We need more people biking, walking, taking public transportation. We do not need more people driving. But due to a lack of leadership from the mayor's office and from DOT, New York is moving backwards, not forwards. Injuries like my wife's and fatalities like Sarah's are on the rise. It is time for the mayor and the council expired. and the DOT to honor the many promises they have made to Families for Safe Streets and all the many other passionate street safety fighters who stand with us. Vision Zero is not just a slogan to us. We need all of you to take Vision Zero seriously. Otherwise, New York will continue to lose Sarah's and Christine's. Please do not let that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panelist? Seeing none, we will next hear from Mark O'Connor Diaqua. Marco. Time starts now. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marco Connor Diakwa. I am Deputy Director with Transportation Alternatives. And um, thank you, uh, Chair Rodriguez, for convening this important hearing. And thank you very much for your uh, leadership. Um, although New York City desperately needs a paradigm shift uh, for how our streets are designed and used, we commend Commissioner Trottenberg and her staff for their work to advance critical projects during very challenging times, including open streets, uh, restaurant seating, and life-saving speed safety cameras. Um, but please do not believe the hype that we can't have nice things in New York City because of this pandemic. From our city administrations and from too many of our elected officials, it was another excuse yesterday and another excuse before that. Um, this is the wealthiest city in the richest country on earth. Recovering from this pandemic requires us to reimagine our city, especially our streets, for the better, not for the status quo, or even for the worse, with Carmageddon looming if inaction remains the guiding principle. Without decisive action, we may lose New York City's future to growing congestion, pollution, inequality, and traffic violence. However, the uplifting part of what we are all experiencing right now is that the solutions are at our fingertips. What we need is political courage and vision. First, do not believe the hype that open streets, bus lanes, and bike lanes cause traffic or that they're bad for business. The truth is the exact opposite. 
um, after 14th Street in Manhattan, for example, was made into a busway, we saw improved travel times um, with 30% decreases in travel times, increased ridership, um, and traffic did not worsen on adjacent streets. Retail sales for businesses along Fulton Street Mall in Brooklyn. Times uh, expires. Organization of Times Square um, saw a significantly increased retail sales. Um, and protected bike lanes, open streets, and more space for pedestrians save lives and they're good for businesses. Please do not believe otherwise. Um, in addition, by investing in safe and equitable streets, the city's strained budget will benefit from less spending on NYPD and emergency crash responses, medical and public health expenses, and lost wages and economic, lost economic activity for the city uh, and crash victims. What we need is political courage and will uh, to get this done for the city, for improved protected bike lanes, bus lanes, busways, and permanent expanded open streets. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panelist? Seeing none, uh, we will next uh, circle back to hear from uh, Stephanie Mansfield. Is Stephanie available? And time starts now. Stephanie, do we have you? Okay, I think we're gonna skip Stephanie again and, and try and come back at the end. Uh, next, we will hear from Rose Ustianowski. Rose. Is Rose available? Okay. Um, I think next we will hear from Christine Birthday. Um, hi, sorry, Rose here. Um, I think I was on mute before. Time starts now. Okay, sorry about that. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Councilman Rod Rodriguez and the rest of the transportation committee um, for holding this oversight hearing today. As the Staten Island organizer for transportation alternatives, I was both hopeful and excited when New York City's Open Streets program was originally announced, eager to make the most of the opportunities they bring to Staten Island. While I appreciate the Open Streets program and its potentials, it's become increasingly, increasingly clear to me that its implementation has limited what Open Streets can achieve for Staten Island and the rest of New York City. The biggest limiting factor I've seen by far is the reliance that the Department of Transportation has placed on community partners in facilitating open streets. Leaving the facilitation of open streets to community partners not only shifts a government responsibility onto the hands of private individuals, but it also creates clear inequities in the success of various open streets. Under this model, open streets that are located in wealthier neighborhoods that have the most resources to bring tend to benefit the most from this program, while open streets in less privileged neighborhoods are, are supposed to be managed by the local police precinct, they are more, more often left to either flounder or simply disappear. I have visited such open streets where the barriers were long since destroyed and nobody from the local police precinct seemed aware that open street that the open street was supposed to be their responsibility in the first place. Another major inequity troubling me is the disparity in where open streets are located. Of the dozens of miles of open streets that I've that have been opened throughout New York City, barely two miles of those streets are located in Staten Island. And that's including those that are filled with traffic due to a lack of maintenance. In addition, we've received no temporary bike infrastructure of any kind. This inequity leaves Staten Islanders at the bottom end of a program that could benefit New York City greatly. Um, since Staten Island is already known as a forgotten borough, this simply 
contributes to a sense that we've been forgotten by the city and that we don't matter. Um, so I'd love to see these inequities addressed by the Department of Transportation. I'd love to see all open streets treated equally and get equal amount and you know, benefit the community equally. I'd also, I'd also love to see equity in where these streets are located so that the Open Streets Program is truly a five borough program that benefits all Staten Islanders and all boroughs. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions for this panelist? Seeing none, we will next hear from Christine Birthday. Christine. Okay. I'm starting Can you hear me? now. So my name is Christine Berthe and I'm the founder of CheckPed, the pedestrian rights organization. Our community on the west side of Manhattan asked for open street in order to provide distancing for pedestrian and a front yard for residents. We also wanted to save our vibrant community, restaurant community. The programs the DOT announced was consistent with our expectation. DOT designed and announced the program in two weeks an extraordinary performance under COVID quarantine. Of the 20 requests for open street in our district, eventually 10 were approved. The vast majority of restaurants took advantage of, of the open dining. So what went right? Well, each community group could choose to participate or not. The application form was simple. Whenever there was a bid or a highly committed block association or restaurant owners, the open street was a success. What were the obstacles? NYPD stopped operating the barricade due to higher priority. Uh, the barricades were of very poor quality and drivers broke them too easily. Watching the barricades turn out to be mu too much of a lift for many block association. Some bars used the open street as a party space and many underserved communities were not even aware of the program. For open dining, the sidewalks are excessively crowded. How to make it better? P provide much sturdier barricades, water field that cannot be moved. Provide official signage, old NYPD to their commitment, and enroll the council member and borough president to spread the word to all community and sponsor civic association. For open dining, the dining should be on the parking lane or on the sidewalk but not on both. These are terrific programs. We just need to improve on it and make them available permanently to all and especially those who deserve it the most. Time's Thank expired. You. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panelist? Seeing none, uh, we will hear next from Patrick McClellan. Patrick. Time starts now. Thank you. My name is Pat McClellan. I'm the director of policy for the New York League of Conservation Voters. I want to thank Chair Rodriguez and uh, members of the council for the opportunity to testify today. So the Open Streets program since it started has had widespread use and enthusiasm from New Yorkers. We think it's been an unqualified success, um, but there have been some shortcomings that we think can be improved in the future. So we're grateful for the opportunity today to make some of those suggestions. Uh, the first issue is transparency from the mayoral administration on this, um, both how streets are selected in the first place and how decisions are made about closing down streets um, that uh, for whatever reason City Hall decides are not successful. Uh, there really needs to be a transparent process here so that communities can play more of a role and evaluate the program more fully. And second, the Open Streets program would function better as a connected network of roads uh, that are close to through traffic rather than as isolated and sometimes short uh, sections. You know, the point of the program in our view is not to provide a small number of isolated blocks to give people room to breathe, but to create uh, a networked corridor for biking, walking, biking, and safe socializing. Uh, third, as others have mentioned, too many of the open streets are disregarded by drivers. Um, at times we've seen wooden sawhorses destroyed uh, and essentially vigilante action from some reckless drivers to return open streets to cars. We don't think that police enforcement is necessary for this program to be successful, but uh, we do think that the city can provide communities with sturdier barriers to protect families and deter reckless drivers. 
And then fourth and most important by far, the open streets program is not equitable. Um, in its early days, the program disproportionately benefited wealthier and whiter neighborhoods. And the city has made commendable progress on making the program more equitable since April. Um, but you know, parks, open space, and safe infrastructure for pedestrians and cyclists aren't equitably distributed across the city. Uh, and neither are the impacts of COVID-19. So a truly equitable open streets program needs to prioritize and disproportionately benefit neighborhoods that have fewer parks, less open space, and have been impacted harder by COVID-19. Um, and finally, I just wanna mention uh, that again, I think others have noted, there's been a boom in bike sales and cycling during the pandemic. We certainly hope and expect that that will be a permanent shift even after all of this is over. And the city needs to have a plan in place to make biking safe for all of those new cyclists. And we can't wait until the bike master plan, which is still more than a year out. So we hope that the city is working on a plan that's actionable uh, with short term results that can be communicated uh, in short order. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panelist? Seeing none, we will next hear from Regina Fojas. Regina. Time starts now. My name is Regina Fojas and I'm the Director of External Affairs at the Times Square Alliance, speaking on behalf of our president, Tim Tompkins. The Alliance would like to thank the speaker and council member Rivera for their leadership on open streets and council member Reynoso for championing outdoor dining. We also wanna thank Chair Rodriguez for his continued leadership in creating new transportation paradigms and improving Times Square's public spaces. The Open Streets program has been vital considering the pandemic's impact on Times Square. Our average pedestrian counts initially plummeted by more than 90% from 2019. And in July, 55% of our restaurants remained closed. The Open Streets program brought back some vibrancy to Times Square by allowing New Yorkers and visitors to explore the neighborhood in a socially distanced manner and by giving our restaurants a lifeline through the Open Restaurants program. Today, our bow tie pedestrian counts are down 73% and 50% of our restaurants have reopened. There's still much work to be done, but the Open Streets program has encouraged the city to rethink public space and make a leap towards economic recovery. While we know there were challenges, we wanna thank DOT for a tremendous job working flexibly with bids to make the Open Streets and Open Restaurants programs happen. We urge the city to build upon the foundation that these programs have created. We're thrilled about the city's decision to bring back outdoor dining next summer and support the initiative to extend it past October 31st. However, it shouldn't end here. We strongly believe that if we continue to use public space innovatively, we'll build back a New York that's not only more resilient and better prepared for future pandemics, but also one that is safer and more exciting for visitors this is the city's opportunity to work with organizations like the Alliance to implement vibrant and care for outdoor public spaces across all five boroughs. These spaces must accommodate competing uses such as pedestrian and cyclist movement, commercial activity, Time program. Fired. This will require thoughtful integrated management and we are eager to be a partner in that process through COVID-19 and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panelists? Seeing none, we'll next hear from Don Sif. Don? Time starts now. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for this hearing. Thank you, Commissioner Trottenberg. We want to thank Carlina Rivera, Councilwoman Carlina Rivera, and um, our councilman in 25, Daniel Drum, for the open streets and for advocating for our district. Um, we just want to say that, that Zeke, come here. I'm calling my son over because I want to see if he'll read something that he read at a rally. We had a rally in our neighborhood. We have six public schools up and down 34th Avenue along our open streets. And these public schools are starved for outdoor space. Every day when my children come home from school, I would ask them if they were able to play outside. And most of the days they would say no. So this is my son, Zeke Sif, and he's just going to read something that he read at a rally. Um, at my school, I go outside once a week for 15 minutes. All we have to play with is jump rope and hula hoops. On all other days, we watch a mo the same movie shorts over and over again for a week length every day. 
34th Avenue would make it more often, more fun, and upgrade another level. So I just want to say to everybody that this is not only really important for our community, which was one of the hardest hit by COVID-19, um, and one of the communities that has the most narrow sidewalks and the least amount of park space, but also this is just imperative for the health of our children um, and our schools. Our schools have been lobbying for more space. PS212 in Queens, which is a, a packed elementary school, does not have an adjacent street that we can use for play space. Uh, and our children really do not get to go outside enough. So we are urging open streets to be our open street, 34th Avenue, which is beloved in our community, to be extended up through Francisco Moyes district all the way to 114th street uh, so that our residents can have more space. We have more schools along that way. Also to safely travel to Flushing Meadows Corona Park, which is our nearest park space. And we're asking that you- I'm expired. Permanent. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panelist? Seeing none, we will next call on Melody Bryant. Melody? Time starts now. Okay. I'm really moved by Don's testimony. Uh, my name is Melody Bryant and I thank the members of the Transportation Committee for taking my testimony. I live on a block I'm convinced is the noisiest in Manhattan, West 22nd and Marine 7th and 8th. There's always a moving van, a contractor double parked and aggravated drivers honking to get them out of the way so they can get to the top of the block. Open streets changed all that for my block. Initially, the idea was for West 22nd to be open to pedestrians to social distance against COVID-19. Our sidewalks are narrow. We were dodging each other, trash piled for collection and dog walkers. We needed more space. The neighborhood took to it instantly. The next thing I knew, people were strolling in the street with their dogs, with grocery carts, walking hand in hand. After months cooped up in tiny apartments because of the virus, we really needed this. We still do. I thought there'd be a lot of pushback from drivers. There's a garage on my street and there are still cars coming through, but they move slowly now and drivers nearly always close the barriers behind them. The drivers who do park on the block are relieved to have less through traffic. There are still many trucks on the street, but now the workmen can get their work done without hassle because the through, the through traffic is virtually nil. When strangers see me moving the barriers, they frequently thank me for the quiet we now have. Neighbors I'd never met pitch in to keep the barriers closed throughout the day. But the best part, the best part are the new sounds you hear on West 22nd. The guy in his wheelchair with the speaker playing salsa, riding safely in the street, no longer having to navigate uneven pavement the sounds of skateboards, scooters, and city bike bells, or kids calling out to their parents as they practice learning how to ride their bikes. They come from other blocks to do this, and I have photos of all of it. It seems the city wants to cancel open streets at the end of October, but that makes no sense to me since we'll still have a temp pandemic and social distancing will still be needed. As winter drives us back indoors, I'm hoping the deadline will be extended till the end of this pandemic. Having the streets open for walking has transformed West 22nd, and we'd like to keep it. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions for this panelist? Seeing none, we will next hear from Nuala Doherty. Nuala. And time starts now. Is Nuala available? Okay, uh, we can circle back to Nuala. Um, next. Hello, we'll hello. Oh. Can you hear yeah, me now? Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Um, so my name's Nuala Odardi Naranjo. Uh, I live here in Jackson Heights, just a few blocks from Elmer's Hospital, which has to be the epicenter of the Elmer's Hospital. <laughs> Hello, we're having difficulty hearing you. The opening of 34th Avenue has really saved our neighborhood. It's been a lifeline for so many families, whether it was learning to ride a bike or just taking a stroll or getting some exercise. Um, our open street on 34th Avenue is all run by volunteers. Uh, my son and I and many other volunteers open the street in the morning 
at 8 a.m. and we close the street at 8 p.m. and let the cars back in. The key here is it's all volunteers and it's been great for our neighborhood of Jackson Heights. But it ends at 94th Street um, and our neighboring uh, community of Corona has been excluded. And it just seems unfair. And you have to wonder why the more wealthy neighborhood of Jackson Heights is included. And yet the uh, poor neighborhood of Corona has been excluded from this open seats program. We originally asked for 34th Avenue to run all the way from uh, 69th Street to Hinton Park at the Grand Central Parkway, 114th Street. And we urge the commissioner to continue it. It's been a great success. And we'd love to see it continue all the way to Hinton Park at 114th Street. And we ask that that be allowed so that Corona can get the same benefits we've had in Jackson Heights. So please make it permanent and continue it to 114th Street. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panelist? Seeing none, um, we will next hear from Stephanie Mansfield. Stephanie? Can you guys hear me now? I hope so. Yes, <laughs> finally. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the technical difficulties earlier. Um, hi. <laughs> um, my name is Stephanie Mansfield, and I am a domestic violence survivor. And I am a single mom of three who are all under the age of nine. On March 28th, 2019, two of my children were part of a car crash while crossing the street in the care of a daycare center. My son, Jean, well, I call him Jean, Jean-Jacques because it's French. Um, he was hit by a driver who whipped around the corner, neglecting to yield to a car as well as the children before him. My son, Andre, who was four at the time, was behind him and nearly as hit as well. Nothing, and I mean nothing, could prepare a parent or anyone um, for that call. I was helpless, and yet I was one of the lucky ones. Um, my son is able to go home. My son is able to play with his siblings. My son is able to do many things that other children are not able to do at this time. Um, these are things that people tend to forget is trauma. <laughs> the trauma that my son Andre endured <laughs> to presume that his younger brother was dead when he saw his youngest brother get hit by that car when he saw his younger brother lifeless on the street, when he saw his not being explained what happened to his younger brother as he was trotted off back to the daycare. And I look and I say, I wasn't able to get my son at that time. My youngest, the, the, my middle son, I wasn't able to get him. I went straight to the hospital. So it wasn't until someone from my family picked him up that he was made aware that his younger brother was not dead. So even though he was not hit, he was nearly hit. The PTSD affects him to this day. It's as real as if it happened yesterday. And I am blessed that both of my sons are still alive. I'm a member of the family of um, Safe Streets and I have met many families whose loved ones and family members are not alive. But I've come to learn that all of these deaths and senseless injuries are preventable. They are preventable. One, on the one year anniversary of my son's crash, in the midst of the quarantine, because it was March, I walked to the site on Avenue P and West 12th in Brooklyn, and I visited that site. And even though I made signs and petitions and did all of these things to implement change for my neighborhood, I have yet to see those changes that I was promised by the DOT that I was told and said, yes, we will make those changes. And yes, these things will be changes. What does it take? What does it take? One year later, things are not done. What does it take to make change? Does a child need to die? Does Jean, does Jean-Jacques and Andre need to die? Does an elderly person need to die? What about a family? Does a family need to die on that corner? What does it make for change to occur? What do, can it be as simple as seeing the problem and fixing it before people get hurt? What is the value of a person's life? During the pandemic, as the restrictions lift, we see the need for space 
safe spaces for people to socially distance and to travel is so crucial. There are no open spaces in my neighborhood. And yet <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. There is a need for it. Um, I know I'm over my time. I apologize. I'm almost done. Um, but as a parent, when I go to a park and I see that the park is overcrowded, I go and I see the cars whizzing on wide open blocks. For my children's mental health, they need to be outside as this, the, the weather permits it. But where do I take them? The bike shop right next to my house. The business has been booming. The business is so... Um, has been booming, but yet there is no bike lanes in my neighborhood. There's no extensive bike lanes in my neighborhood. There's none of these things that should be in my neighborhood. So even once COVID is open, like, like <laughs> the lack of bike lanes in my neighborhood is unbelievable. So once COVID is open, these open streets need to be made permanent, I believe, because it's a need, it's crucial, it's essential yeah. for people to so, be straight. So yes. yeah, so and yeah, so uh, first of all, this is the type of thing that we're gonna be working together. Uh, and and as you say, like as chairman of this committee, uh, together with everyone, including yourself, you know, family for safe street transportation alternative, we are committed to continue bringing more city bike, open street, addressing all those challenges that you have addressed. So I do appreciate, you know, all your comment and we definitely are committed to continue working together. So thank you. As well as bike lanes, it's, as well as yeah. like just open space for like- the Thank children. you, we will. We will thank continue you. work. Thanks, bye. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thanks. And thank are you for- any, Are there any questions for this panelist? Seeing none, uh, we will next call on Noel Hidalgo. Noel. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Noel Hidalgo and I'm the executive director of Beta NYC. And I currently am speaking on behalf of Beta NYC in my personal experiences maintaining open streets. I'm one of 80 North Brooklyn neighbors who are maintaining our streets. And we have formed the North Brooklyn Com Open Streets Community Coalition to build, maintain, repair, and set up our barriers. Uh, we have eight local nonprofits and two council members. Thank you, council member Renoso and Levin for being a part of the coalition that is collectively stitching together solutions to and address the issues that appear on our streets. I have witnessed construction vehicles crush barricades and protests. My neighbors have witnessed others ram barricades in frustration. I have been yelled and cursed at for setting up barricades. I've been called a communist. I've also been nearly hit by setting up barricades. I have witnessed countless delivery trucks continue to make their normal deliveries without a problem. And I have witnessed small businesses reestablish themselves on the sidewalk and reclaim a bit of revenue. I've been witness to families enjoying the summer and spaces in front of their apartments. I have watched elderly neighbors get their morning steps in, neighbors in wheelchairs enjoy their street while the sidewalk that they pass has pinch point points that are less than two feet wide. After months of sheltering in place and witnessing the deaths of Breonna Taylor, Daniel Prude, Ahmaud Aubrey and George Floyd, I'm here to testify that our open streets have helped New Yorkers reclaim their dignity. We have been maintaining our open streets since Memorial Day weekend, and we currently oversee 2.3 miles of open streets. That's 42 intersections. We have replaced over 50 legs, including 18 in one day. We're currently waiting for 40 legs and 10 crossbars. We've waited 2.5 weeks to hear back from the NYPD's barricade department, and we want to single out and thank Captain Fahey from the 94th Precinct to being diligent about getting us our replacement barriers. Time's expired. We've been told, yeah, time has expired. Okay. Um, we have been told that this is the last of our, the barricades that we will ever get, um, and we need, I will send this written testimony in. But frankly, um, we are, as community partners, are truly underserved when we're unable to get barricades. Um, we are in a position where we're having to replace legs after legs after legs after legs. Um, I will submit the rest of my written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panelist? Uh, seeing none, 
we will next hear from Jeffrey Le Francois. Jeffrey. Time starts now. Hi there, thank you. My name is Jeffrey LeFrancois and I'm the executive director of the Meatpacking Business Improvement District in Manhattan. Thank you to Speaker Johnson, Chair Rodriguez, and to the administration and the Department of Transportation for standing up the Open Streets Program, which has given street space back to people and allows for the operation of restaurants for dining outside. The Meatpacking Bid represents over 200 businesses and has a significant workforce and visitor population. Yet despite that, 80% of public space is dedicated to cars, while just 20% of space outside is space for pedestrians and sidewalk cafes. The Open Streets program helps to bring those numbers closer together as the district works to bring a more pedestrian focus and pedestrian safety to its streetscape. After all, it's people who eat and shop. Cars do not. We're proud to be managing six blocks of the program, including one at Robert Fulton House's, a night of development on West 17th Street. The Meatpacking Bid fully supports making open streets and open rest streets restaurants programs a permanent part of the city's streetscape. As a part of making these permanent programs permanent, we also ask the city to provide winter guidance for outdoor dining too. While indoor dining may be on the horizon, many people may not feel comfortable eating inside. There's no reason the city cannot provide parameters for restaurants to operate heaters, partial enclosures and other elements so New Yorkers can dine outside in parkas year round. The program should also be expanded to create a network of open streets that safely connects neighborhoods. The program should also allow for non-restaurant establishments to use outdoor space with guidance provided to the from the city, much like DOT did for open streets restaurants. This program has not been without its problems. Vehicular drivers are reckless and destroyed all of the DOT and NYPD provided barriers. The bid purchased its own barriers and has employed a significant signage program to educate drivers, but barriers continue to be destroyed as drivers ignore the rules, which endanger pedestrians and add an increased financial burden on the bid. Ironically, our plazas are lined with large granite blocks as a means to, of protection for pedestrians from I'm cars. Sorry. But it's a 15, 15 pound piece of metal used to block off the street to make this program work. The city should be bold and provide guidance for infrastructure to make barriers stronger and potentially permanent. While we recognize this program was put together quickly and thank you for that, it is also exactly the type of thinking New York City should be doing to bring our city into the 21st century. As global cities around the world install protected bike networks, vastly improve public transit and smartly expand business outside, New York has an opportunity to be bold and do so with smart planning. Providing more resources and guidance can make that happen. We thank look you. forward to managing Sir. open streets this year and next. Thanks thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll next hear from Jim Burke. Jim. Hi, Hi. I'm Chair Rodriguez. Thank you for this hearing. Um, my name is Jim Burke, and I'm one of the founding members of the 34th Avenue Open Streets Coalition. We have about two dozen volunteers that open and close our streets each morning and evening. And we want to let you know we are thrilled with our open street. We want to thank the mayor, the DOT, the city council. Uh, for choosing our, our open street in the first place. I actually had the pleasure of showing it to the Commissioner Trottenberg and, and walk with her staff uh, most of the length of it. And she herself said it was, uh, if not the best, one, one of the best, the, the best. And we're calling on our mayor, the city council and DOT to make it permanent. It's been life-changing. We were the epicenter of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we don't have sidewalks to keep any, uh, any social distance. We have one park and it's really small. Uh, and most of our population here is, especially as you get in the higher numbers are doubled up in small apartments. So we were literally like bursting at the seams and people for, for months had been in their homes. So when this opened up overnight, we had a 1.3 linear park where everyone was able to take their children, uh, practice physical distancing. Uh, and if you come to 34th Avenue any day, you will see people doing salsa and Zumba and Pilates. You will see kids uh, playing games. You'll see seniors playing bingo. Uh, our latest initiative now that we're running is English as a second language conversation classes, five days a week. This is amazing. We have come together as a community after such tragic months of, of, of loss and people being sick in our families. And unfortunately, a lot of our com community members uh, passing due to COVID. So this has been a very healing, wonderful thing, but we need to make it permanent. 
Uh, we started a petition and right away, we already have a thousand of our neighbors that signed on to this. And this kind of open street should be in every single neighborhood in New York City. Time's expired. Be connected. So again, I wanna thank everybody listening, but please make this a part of New York City permanently. And thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panelist? Seeing none, um, next we will hear from Jackson Chabot. Jackson. Hello everyone, can you hear me? No. Good afternoon, my name is Jackson Chabot and I'm here representing Open Plans as a Transportation Policy Associate. Thank you for hosting this session. I'm here to wholeheartedly support the continuation and the expansion of the Open Street Program. I'd like to highlight three recommendations to build upon the program's successes. First, open streets should be made permanent, open 24 seven and supported by a DOT administered small grants program. This will ensure pedestrians and cyclists know the streets are for them and they can safely use the street. This program has galvanized community members to create open streets coalition, dedicated volunteers set up and break down open streets on Avenue B, 34th Avenue and across North Brooklyn uh, twice a day amongst others. This ongoing effort requires significant volunteer coordination and makes the program cumbersome for communities to manage. The grants program would directly support community-led management and programming. Second, open streets must have better barriers and signage to protect users from drivers. Open streets are spaces where friends and families gather at safe physical distances, children bike and play, and restaurant seating is at capacity. Open Streets Coalition members have consistently reported, as you've heard today from many people already, drivers running over wooden saw horses and ignoring clearly marked open street signage. Third and finally, the DOT must extensively engage communities using an equity lens, safely meeting communities where they are at and on their terms. The engagement process should focus on areas that have been systemically under-resourced to best understand what communities might want from the Open Streets program umbrella, because Open Streets have provided many, but not all communities with wonderful public space this summer. Thank you for your support and your vision to ensure that Open Streets became a reality. The program must be expanded and improved because this, many systemically under-resourced communities have not been able to partake and access the benefits of Open Streets. To the City Council, I ask that you continue to insist the DOT develop and expand the program using an equity lens to ensure that all New Yorkers across all five boroughs can safely use their streets. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panelist? Seeing none, um, next we will hear from HP Schroer. HP. HP. Okay, um, if we don't have him at this time, we'll try again in a, in a moment. Uh, so next we will hear from Laura Shepard. Laura. Can we unmute Laura? Thank you. Hi, uh, Hi. it's now. Okay, hello, thanks for letting me testify. I'm Laura Shepard, Bike Network Organizer at Open Plans. I'm here because our city's bike network still falls short and falls short and feel, fails to meet the needs and the moment. We need a safe and connected network for traveling throughout the city and safe routes for biking around our neighborhoods. We are grieving too many recent fatalities as we remain frustrated with the politically driven log jams on long promised and long needed bike projects. This year's bike boom was no surprise. Bikes have steadily gained popularity for years amongst commuters, delivery workers, and as more styles and types of e-bikes and cargo bikes have become available and affordable, families, women, seniors, people with disabilities, and people who travel longer distance. This year, they were an obvious choice for physical distancing. Ridership is mainly constrained by uh, substandard infrastructure from dangerous arterials to pinch points like the Queensboro Bridges sh uh, crowded shared path. We need the South Outer Roadway open to pedestrians, and we need two additional cycling, cycling lanes to accommodate bike traffic and growth on the Brooklyn Bridge. We respect the challenges DOT faces at the moment, but we must ask that our safety take precedence over routine maintenance projects that solely benefit drivers. We can't afford not to invest in our protected bike lane network. 
We need these projects expedited and we need them done right the first time. This year's early pop-up lanes fail to protect riders and inspire confidence in our cycling network. Future projects must include solid vertical barriers and clear multilingual signage from day one. Vehicle drivers are the greatest threat to New Yorkers who walk, bike, live, work, dine, and shop here, and we need to be physically protected from them. We also need the dangerous vehicle abatement program, and we need to further reduce speed limits. The behavior of drivers who speed with impunity, obstruct our sidewalks and bike lanes, and physically and verbally assault pedestrians and cyclists demonstrates an abhorrent disregard for human life and the responsibility of operating vehicles on, in public space. We will not recover from the many crises we're in right now, COVID or climate, by appeasing suburban wannabes, but by doubling down on being a city. We must continue repurposing street space to keep us safe, healthy, and meet the needs of our residents and businesses. We must also make our open streets permanent and year round to uh, supplement our bike network and help people who commute uh, after 8 p.m. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll try again. Do we have HP Schroer now? HP? Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes, HP Schroer. Go ahead. I'm H.P. Schroer, a 94-year-old World War II veteran and director of UMIWI, a veterans advocacy organization. We represent 12,000 veterans attending CUNY colleges in the city. Our mission is to enable them to purchase Metro cards at the same price as seniors. Mindful of the MTA's financial difficulties, we focused on ways to not fund the discount from their budget. To accomplish this, two state bills were rewritten, Assembly Bill AO2131A and Senate Bill S3372A. These bills enable all veterans to a half fare on the MTA. Almost three years ago, with the help of Chaim Deutsch, Bill Perkins, and Corey Johnson, the mayor and city council approved allowing veterans attending CUNY colleges to a discount on the MTA. Unfortunately, the mayor changed the requirements for qualification. And after two years, only 240 out of the 12,000 veterans were approved for this disc. My question is why were the requirements changed by the mayor? And when will you correct this injustice? To be eligible, the veterans were only required to prove they were honorably discharged and attending college in the city. As I mentioned before, we looked to the state for a solution. And although we secured a majority of legislators to support the bills, they have not been put up for a vote. Why? Because of a lack of money. We recognize due to the decimation of budgets caused by COVID-19, a new source for money had to be found. So what did we do? The governor suggested think out of the box. The solution, create a veteran scratch lotto, where the proceeds from the sale are dedicated to allowing veterans to purchase fares on public transportation at the same price as seniors. Both sponsors of the state bills, Senator Brooks and Jeffrey Dinowitz, will be requesting the governor to approve the veterans lotto. Here is your source for the money to find the discount for veterans going to CUNY colleges in the city. We ask the mayor and the council to join us in our mission. Tell the mayor and his representatives on the MTA board to support the lotto. Ask the governor, ask the mayor to direct his Department of Veterans Services to take action to support the lotto. You can help by advising all state legislators to support the lotto and have your borough presidents in their newsletters alert the public of the lotto.
veteran, um, I have a few more sentences. Veterans contribute to the economic growth of the city. Over the last 10 years, we have lost 35% of our veterans' population. One of the reasons being the high cost of public transportation. Time is of the essence. There will be no Veterans Day parade to honor those who have served and sacrificed for our country. What better way of thanking veterans for their service than backing the words with action and having the mayor and the governor on Veterans Day announce the creation of a veteran scratch lotto? I thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, um, I'll turn the hearing back over to Chair Rodriguez. Thank you. First of all, thank you, HP, for uh, being the voice of the veteran, for dedicating your life and, and being today advocating again for not only the veteran, for have to make our a great city of New York a better place for everyone. And, and with this, we're coming to the end of this hearing. And a lot to follow up. And everyone here are heroes. Everyone here are leaders. And then the only thing that I do as a chairman of this committee is to be sure that I connect with individuals like you who are advocates from Family for Safe Street, you know, from better urban planning for individuals that care for transportation alternative and to my colleague also who I've been working together with and the great staff that we have in this committee, including the sergeant, thank you for your service. So we coming to the end with this and, and, and hopefully in the, next couple of, in the next couple of weeks, we will have other hearings on TLC, uh, how have the agency been responded during the COVID-19 and what other thing will be will they be doing to also to support the drivers? We're going to be also having hearing on the MTA. We cannot let the MTA to maintain the services closed at midnight it, 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 from 12 to 6. It, and, and we also need to hear from them. So with that, thank you everyone. And, and we come to the end of this hearing. With, and this hearing now is adjourned.